Educating, informing, serving. Fact TV, keeping government honest. It is 6 10. Uh, we are meeting in the lower theater. It is a regular meeting. The lack of there, I guess. Um, go there, I guess. Um, We can't, we can't hear. Scott, are you talking? Can you hear me now? now? Yes, thank you. Okay, so we have a uh, resolution okay. from development. We have a uh, resolution from development. Kat, sorry, Kat, you're gonna have to mute your computer because we're getting Sorry, Kat, you're gonna have to mute your computer because we're getting into Okay. <laughs> thank you. Taking so, a resolution to just uh, yes. So it'll it be on if I have it here, copy here, and I think uh, the copies were distributed. I think to members for this evening. Um, again, this is only if we are granted the grant. All it does is just say that yes, if we are granted the. So if this is another one. We're going to have to ratify next meeting. Yes, but I want to. Um, we'll have to do it on tonight's agenda. Send it in, and then we'll do the second one. Reason there's a deadline or something. Yes. So we can get stuff on there on time. Well, this hey, is, anything else, Scott? Well, this is the reality of when we're applying for about 10,000 grants. This is what we talked about yesterday at the ARPA meeting. This is the reality of what happens. So, you know, my development office and myself, that's it. So yeah. sometimes yeah, we have to do these things. Any other additions? Or that's it for tonight. Anyone on the board? All right, let's move down to the public's comment on items that are not on the agenda. That's it. I'm not sure if Walter was here for that, but I'll just talk about real quick. Uh, February 15th is a conservation conversation. Everyone is invited. It's at the lower theater here, uh, Wednesday, February 15th at 6.30 p.m. Talking about the Rockingham Meeting House. Unless you said that. Yeah. All right. Uh, I think we have people behind yes, the theater. Um, I'm Shelly Wastelevitz, and I am one of the owners of Seeing So Together over at the Times Building. And um, we've had some complaints from customers about the parking lot, and I agree with them. So I thought maybe you guys would be the people to come to. There's not very much lighting, and we have classes in the evening, and people are having to call their husbands to feel comfortable walking through the parking lot coming my place um, because they're uncomfortable people sitting in their cars and it's dark um, and it's not so bad when there's snow because the snow kind of lights up the parking lot a little bit but for the other 10 and a half months of the year it's quite creepy I walk with my pepper spray all the time and actually tonight there was a camper park there um, the uh, bridge, bridge street, street right, right by the times building Oh, um, okay. Yeah, dark down. It, it is dark down there. <laughs> and the people that I have coming in are usually carrying stuff to come to our classes. So they're feeling like they 
you know, they're kind of feeling quite unprotected. So at least if there was some light, it might help them feel more safe. I know that the police officers, at least during the summertime, do kind of drive by quite a bit, but it, it, there's a lot of transient parking you know, that happens um, in that parking lot. Um, and the other issue, yeah, just during snow time is that um, the cars that are there parked overnight are parked overnight and then they can't plow in the front. The back parking lot, which is the furthest away and having to walk through the most dark, <laughs> um, is all clear, but the front is all piled in snow and it's actually really um, difficult to get out of your car <laughs> and get into the building because the snow is all piled up between and around cars. So I don't know if there's any kind of is that one where we put a sign in there when we're doing? I know there's the one up in the TD Bank lot, the Eddie Greenmont up there. We put a sign that snow removal is taking place, so you got to get your car out of the way. Right. And I don't know if they can that one down. I there. haven't seen one, at least not up in this first. Because I usually park past the second brick building, and I haven't seen a sign through there. Usually it's right there. What is the beginning great Yeah, I Yeah, I haven't seen one. Okay. I will look, but so I don't know if there's anything that you guys can do. But. Well, there's, I, I can be, in terms of lighting, there is no plan at the moment to add additional street lights in the downtown. I think we still have 25 lights that are out in the basic downtown that we're still replacing. So we're looking at you know, another substantial amount of money to do those as we're doing the retrofits on the LEDs. Um, any new lighting down there would have to be something the board would have to take into consideration. and. The concern is that is scheduled for redevelopment as part of the area-wide plan to, to create housing. And so anything that you do there, potentially you'd have to tear out in three to five years if you were in fact on a third housing. So the investment would have to be very uh, carefully designed so that you did not end up spending, you know, a street light can cost you anywhere with the electrical and, and whatever else Green Mountain Power might require, could cost you up to $10,000. So. You could easily spend forty or fifty thousand. I don't disagree that it's dark over there. Yeah. Is there and any it, way to put in solar powered motion detector lights? I mean, I have those outside my house that work. Right. They're not great, but they work fairly well. <clears throat> from completely dark to some kind of lighting. I mean, you can get some decent ones for that are not too expensive. We could look at a solar option and I see if it might do something. That, right. There's a little bit of tree trimming that needs to happen over there too. Um, the one light kind of towards the middle, it's got a lot of um, little trees that have sprung up around it. And it really, during the summer when the leaves are up, it really completely obscures that light. So just cutting those back and then maybe a little bit towards the back of the track. One of the lights might be a little bit hidden. Could you, could you stipulate that the um... You know, people would park the best have to park in the back part of the lot, the more northern part of the lot. So that so that the front would be available for, for more public use. This is gonna be the challenge as we go forward because we're gonna be selling more permits over there when the Bellas Falls garage opens up right. because they don't have enough parking for all of their residents. So you're gonna probably have 15 or 20 additional people, depending upon how many people with cars end up moving there they're going to want additional parking as well so you know these are the challenges the board's going to have to wrestle with when we look at all of these options there's no way we can put additional lighting on the poles that are currently there i mean you know if they're shining in one way maybe put one maybe get a little bit more additional lighting on there um you can i don't know how we could try i don't know how effective it's it something we'd have to look at anyway right definitely you can certainly take a look at it so at this point, Bridge Street parking lot is actually the most used parking lot for um, overflow parking in the downtown. Uh, people are much more likely to find that than the waypoint, I find. When we have, like when we had, you know, Dar at the Opera House, it was, a, the Bridge Street parking lot was filled and there was no additional cars parked at the waypoint center. It is a busy parking lot. It's it's often difficult to find a spot except for way out in the very back. So it is busy. 
Okay, we'll, uh, we'll take a look at it. Yeah, we'll look at some other actions to see what we can do. Thank yep, you. that's great. Anyone else? Seeing and hearing none, uh, let's move on to the manager's report. Yeah, so a couple things. So I guess because of the, you know, it was so bitterly cold last weekend, just wanted to remind people that there is something in the state of Vermont, we'll put some stuff on the website as well, called the Citizens Assistance Registry for Emergencies. So if you need special types of help or it, more for things when we have, for example, longer term power outages or, or if you need special assistance when we have to do, God forbid, some sort of evacuation. But with that kind of cold, you never know what could be happening. And so if you do have somebody in your family that requires medical oxygen or is in a wheelchair or has some other types of limitations, registering them for this program helps when there's a 911 call so they know what kind of assistance to send. And certainly then it helps them prioritize calls if somebody does call and say, hey, you know, I live with such and such an address, it comes up on the 911 system. And it gives the it gives the first responders at least some additional information. You know, luckily this this weekend with those really dangerous temperatures, we were fairly fortunate we didn't have any long term power issues. But those are concerns, and I know that you know we do have a fairly large population here of elderly folks, and it's something for somebody to consider that might help you know a family member. And it's a fairly simple process to register, and it just sort of helps them. And keep keep a family member safer when we have these kind of events. So we'll post it on the website. Hopefully, folks will hear this and, and take a look and look into it. And I think it might be a benefit no matter what happens for folks. Um, you know, as we deal with more of these extreme weather events. So that was it. Is that? Yeah. Um, I think that we should look at trimming back some of the vegetation behind town hall, uh, some of the, the trees and shrubbery that's starting to grow up back there. It's kind of a periodic thing and it's getting a little bit um, a little bit out of hand. It's not really very good for the for the building to have so much stuff growing up against the side of it. So it might be time to trim back there again. Take a look at it. Now, before we get into the regular agenda, we will have a meeting of the liquor commissioners. There are three applications. One is for the Moose Lodge for our first club, uh, uh, first class club license, a third class club license, J.W. Sandry for a second class license, and Penguin Mark LLC for a second class license. We can do all three of them at once. There are new forms here, and uh, I'd like to sign them for approval. I do not like this new form. Uh, I have been to the state and asked them if there was a wrong download, if they're going to correct this thing. And the woman sent me back another one, uh, an email about uh, three o'clock this afternoon showing a section that's supposed to be on this form that says approval or denial by local board, but it's not on here. So I don't know if there's a page missing from the download from the town clerk. I have no clue. But I did ask the lady from the state to see, check with uh, Kathleen and see if there's what she downloaded the, the, the right stuff. So we need a motion to approve all three. Do you have a, a master copy someone? I do have a clean please. copy here, please, yes. We'll just write on there, approve, and uh, if that's what the board decision is, and we'll all have to sign each sheet. So. Okay, I move that we approve the liquor license for um the rural order of the moose lodge five to seven and the license for penguin market two llc uh second class license for penguin mark and second class license for jw sandry inc second. 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 Uh, liquor license uh, for the Moose Lodge, first class club, and second class, uh, third class club, JW Sandry, second class license, and Penguin Mark uh, for a second class license. Any conversation? Questions? Seeing none, hearing none? All those in favor would say aye. 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 And all those opposed would say nay. Motion carries, man. Uh, Okay, hey, now we'll move into the regular thing, the regular agenda, and I have inserted the res resolution just before the financials. 
just so we can sneak it in here somewhere. Okay. Thank you. Okay, first item on the agenda will be uh, the Depot Street and Bridge Project update. Is DHB so I in? think Scott Burbank's on from DHB, and I'll check with him to see. If, uh, we do have a copy of his PowerPoint. So not sure who's going to be running the. Scott, are you going to be running it off of yours or? Yes, please. Okay, let me see if I can make you the. <clears throat> I have to change and make and make you the. Uh... <coughs> Apparently, I'm not smart enough to flip my background, so VHB is going the right way, but Bob is, so he's taking over from now on. Okay. <laughs> you have a VHB background, so I think yeah, you that's, I mean, I'm, yeah, one step in the right direction, right? Just not two, so. I think you're you're the host now. Okay. Yes, I am. Thank you. Okay. All right. Yes, I know I'm sharing my screen. Thank you. So um, Bob Kleinfelter is here um, from VTrans. Kyle Oppenhauer is also here from VTrans. Uh, Bob is the VTrans project management manager, and Kyle is a historical architecture. What was the last three, right? For preservationists, there we go. Sorry, Kyle, I should know that by now. Um, so he's here just to talk about the bridge rail and any questions we may have about uh, historic significance of the bridge rail. Um, Kelly Berry is here from BHB, she's taking notes. And then Ryan uh, Forbes is also listening in as he is the lead designer on the project. And it's just good for him to hear all this stuff because hopefully we'll have some conclusions and we can finalize the roadway design. So um, I'm assuming you're able to see the PowerPoint are showing? Yes, we're good. Thank you. All right. Good. Now, why won't you go forward for me? There we go. All right. So please let me know if there's anything you think should have been on the agenda that wasn't. I've got all kinds of PDFs and Google Earth open and whatever we need to, to further discuss. But based on the correspondence Scott uh, had with myself, we are looking at the protective coatings for the pedestrian trust and vehicular steel girder. Uh, long-term um, and long-term um, accessibility parking for buses and trains, parallel parking spaces versus the green strip on Canal Street, uh, the bridge railing, as we discussed for, for the vehicular bridge, uh, travel and shoulder width on the vehicular bridge, and then painted versus the truck apron at the intersection of Depot and Canal Streets, and then uh, stormwater treatment and location, and then any questions and I guess, Scott, my thought was maybe it makes sense as each of these are different topics to sort of stop and have questions for each one of them as opposed to waiting at the very end unless you would prefer to do it differently. I just thought, you know, there's a lot there. So it makes sense to talk about protective coatings with the select board and others when we're on that topic. But are you OK no, with that or do you prefer sure, something different? No, that makes sense because there's a lot of material there. So that way people can weigh in and then we'll take, I'm sure, general questions at the end. So. All right. Um, so this first slide is showing various uh, keystone truss bridges. The one on the top is weathering steel, which per our previous meeting back in September, we would not be doing because of the proximity of the water to the bridge and the fact that we will be using salt, presumably on this structure. Um, but I did put it in here because I sort of wanted to show you, this is similar to the length of yours. Um, I don't know what the distance is between the two vertical um, pieces of steel there, but if they're 10 feet, it's a little longer. If they're eight feet, it's similar to yours. So it sort of gives a, an example of what your bridge would look like. And you can sort of see that the arch does go above the railing. Um, and then down on the lower uh, left, we have a similar truss that's powder coated or painted black. Um, the one below that is actually a vehicular bridge, but it's galvanized. So I wanted to show that. So you had an example of what a galvanized bridge would look like. And then the one on the lower right here is brown. And again, that's painted brown and just some examples of colors. So with that, I guess I will turn it over to you and the select board and see what questions you have, et cetera. I guess maybe the first question is, and I know it was in a previous email I shared with the board, and that would be that if we decided on a painted structure, the future maintenance responsibility would fall back on the town. And, and I know you did some just rough estimating of the cost of what it might cost to repaint the structure. And I just wanted to make sure that as we go forward, just the, the town, at least the, the select board is aware 
of some of those potential future costs to, to repaint. Yes, um, to your point, um, I believe, Bob, we said we would galvanize it and then we would paint over it, right? Is that still correct? Yeah, our our recommendation would be um, would be galvanizing the bridge. That's that's the the most durable coating and the least maintenance uh, for the town. And and if there was a concern over that from the appearance of the galvanized coating, it it is possible to paint over it. Uh, however, the the paint system will will fail. Um, it won't jeopardize the corrosion protection of the bridge, but aesthetically, it will not. It won't look great. So, um, the the cost of repainting from an aesthetic standpoint would be um, something that the town would have have to deal with down the road. And painting bridges is very expensive. Yeah, and access here awesome. with the with the canal and everything um but also add some challenges to get underneath it if if painting was needed down below it and and just the containment of of blasting the bridge usually there's there's a whole containment structure that has to go around it here we wouldn't have lead that we're worrying about containing but um to to sandblast the bridge it typically requires a a containment system that fully envelopes the bridge. So I guess the board's interest is just a curiosity, you know, again, nobody knows what it's going to cost. Is it 20 years on a paint job? Is it 30 years? And just a rough number, you know, is it a half a million dollar project or is it a million dollar project? I'm just sort of a, a yeah, you know, range of estimates just so the board gets a sense of it. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that Scott, I don't know if you have, sounds like I, I know you had some numbers pulled pulled up, but I, one, one thing I'll mention is what will likely happen in the immediate term is if you're plowing this bridge, the railing will be, the paint will be scraped right off. So when we have painted over galvanizing, on bridge rail, in a lot of cases, the plows really do a number on it. And I think it, if, unless you, the town feels that winter maintenance could be performed without scratching it, I think that's that's a reality that will likely come up and pretty quickly. As far as the, how long the paint system will last, that's, like you said, it's tough to pin down. I'm, yeah. um, we have, uh, you know, I would think in the 30 to 50 year range, maybe just as a rough guess of, of when it may start to either uh, deteriorate or, or start to peel off in spots. Um, hard to say, but I would think, Scott, I don't know if you would, come up with some different time frames, but no, I, I feel, you know, normally it's 25 to 50, right? Somewhere in there, it will start to deteriorate and it'll definitely be gone by 50 years. There's just, it's not likely to remain. Well, that's nice. I drew some pretty colors in front of my stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah, the other question, a question came up out of the chat too about, and I think the question is, if there is graffiti on the bridge, is there some sort of protection? either built into the galvanizing or built into the other type of application where we could remove it without having, you know, a major production. Yeah, that that's a good question. I'm not sure about um, removing it from galvanizing. That's something we can certainly look into. I think if it were painted, it would, it would just, you could paint over it. Um, that's something we can certainly take a look into though. Right. So, I mean, based on the email, and this again was back in October, we said that the cost could be anywhere from the high hundreds of thousands to even the low millions. So, is there any bridge that you guys can think of recently that was done and repainted just as a something that the, the board might have as a comparison? It, it's tough to say since 
any of the bridges that we're repainting now have lead paint on them. So that's such a significant piece of the cost. It's hard to really, um, hard to say. I mean, we could look at it and get you an estimate. I, I don't, it, it's really tough to say, but in general, painting is very expensive and we try to avoid it on new bridges at all costs. Yeah, and I think the reality is with inflation, it's going to be in the close to a million, right? In 20 years from now, I mean, there's just, how is it not going to be that expensive, right? Or 25 years from now? I mean, and it depends. I mean, the town could, in theory, just touch it up, you know, yeah, that's true. and, and a, as spots start to chip away, I mean, you could get some paint and just touch it up yourself. I, yeah. I don't know how long that would last. Um, but it, it may it may become a losing battle pretty quick. It's, hard, it's really hard to say. Um, the the other reason for, for galvanizing, which is why we would recommend this regardless, is the the inside. I don't know if you can go back to the the uh, pictures there, Scott. But those yeah. the tubes that make up the arch. <laughs> We're seeing the vehicular bridge. Oh, I know. Okay. Yeah. So the 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 tube sections that make up the arch, if with painting those, there's no way to protect the inside. And if you galvanize them, it coats the outside and inside. So there's there's a a benefit to doing that, which is one of the reasons we would definitely recommend galvanizing regardless. could get it galvanized and painted though right that's yes correct that is true yes so it's 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 not like a life we're not reducing the lifespan by not by by painting it all we're saying is it's going to look shiny like all these bridges on this picture do like the one in the middle left and the one on the lower right that's brown but at some point that paint will get scratched scraped and start to fail um, but because we're going to galvanize it underneath, it still has that galvi, galvanized coating underneath it. So it's just aesthetically not going to be as appealing. Um, and because it's over the art, uh, over the canal, they're going to have to tent it um, when they do it. And like Bob said, the, the real expense is because now everything's got lead in it and it's a highway bridge and they have to tent it and there's only so much room. And again, you'd still have only so much room to be underneath that. So you have to build, you'd hang something underneath like a platform to allow them to walk underneath. They put on the mask and they'll, you know, they'll they'll hit it with a sandblasting and take it down and then they'll they'll paint it. If, but to Bob's point, you could come through and do maintenance and touch up what you could reach on a regular basis, and that may extend the lifespan of the bridge. It's just maintenance and and how it goes. So if you wait too long, then it's going to become very expensive. If you do minimal maintenance here and there, it, it could be less expensive, but still may add up over multiple years, right? Whereas the Galvi, we know from experience tends to last a lot longer and it won't get deficient or fail for many years. So I guess that's the, the risk is you can absolutely paint it. It's going to look great and you will probably be maintenance free for 25 to 30 years. And then you will have to do some sort of maintenance. Now, if you sandblast in things is uh, what's the situation of some of that sandblasting material I know you mentioned it has to be covered, but uh, what if it, it gets into the canal? Are we talking environmental issues at that point? Which yes. also increases the price. Right. Yeah, that's that's why they put a whole containment system underneath with tarps and all around it. And then when they blast it, they, they recycle the media, the blasting media. Um, but it all has to be contained. And the, the containment is really some of the larger expense in, in installing that and removing it is can be pretty challenging. In, in this case, it wouldn't, I mean, the, the paint wouldn't have lead in it, of course. So it would be, you wouldn't have to deal with that aspect of it, but it would still just the process of blasting it. And then I think another consideration would be when you do blast it to remove the paint off, you would also probably take some of the galvanized coating when you're doing that as well, it may sort of balance out by, you know, the, the dual protection over time. So it's probably not that big of a deal, but I would think like corners of plates and stuff like that, it would, it would take the galvanizing off pretty quickly during sandblasting. 
Peter, I got a comment I'd like to make. Go ahead, Brian. Um, but should we point out that we don't own the canal? So whatever is going to happen with stuff falling into the canal or, uh, or affecting in any way, that's not our call. Well, could be. If, if you, you contend they want in that canal and, they, and somebody picks it up, they call it environmental, they're going to come after you because you, you, you contaminated the water. Oh, right. But I mean, but to get the, the, the Great River Hydro will has a, has a definite interest in what, whatever we're doing in, in terms of maintenance from below. We're sandblasting, we're putting platforms under there. That is yeah. all true. Yes, that is correct. I guess the thing to point out is though, you will have a permanent right of way or easement. It won't be a right of way, a permanent easement over the canal so that you can maintain your ped bridge, right? I mean, that'll be part of this project is we will have a right of way. Otherwise we can't be there. But the bridge, we can, you know, it would be permanent because we can get a temporary one to install it, but then we don't, you, the town doesn't own the bridge. So there will be a right of way there. But like you said, you will absolutely have to coordinate with the, the canal because you're over their canal. So. Question about the procedure and painting. When this bridge is installed, it will just be lifted into place in one piece, won't it? It'll just be, it'll be a prefabricated piece that is assembled and then lifted into location with crane. It, it will likely come in, the, the trusses will likely come in probably two or three sections that'll be bolted together on site and then lift it into place. Um, I don't I, I don't know if that's what the question was or not. Um, when you, but, you'll assemble the pieces on site and then you'll lift it into place in one whole piece, wouldn't the most logical way to repaint it be to lift the bridge onto land and repaint it there? I mean, it would be avoiding, you know, all of these issues it seems like it would reduce the cost very significantly. Yeah, it would It would be a pretty large crane to pick that whole bridge in one piece, and it's going to have a concrete deck on it. Well, and the other factor is it's it has going to have sewer and water and an electric line on it. So um, if it didn't have any of, if it didn't have the utilities attached to it, I would say that's, that would be feasible um, potentially, but just mobilizing a large crane could get pricey as well. But to your point, it, it, it may make it easier than working over the canal. However, the utilities will uh, likely make that not possible. Same question. Uh, yeah. Maybe it was ruled out already. I don't know. Another meeting, but uh, uh, is there a possibility of a stone bridge like what's there now? Was that already talked about? And yeah, stone bridge, like like right now, it's concrete. It's, well, concrete. concrete yeah. I'm trying to remember that. Well, it's got. Yeah, we went through that. We did. Yeah. <laughs> Same Same time. Time. Yeah, we got to get that one off. Yeah. Funny. <laughs> I was just thinking less paper. <laughs> yeah, the issue. The issue is the lowering the water level in the canal is. Is really not possible. So putting an arch back like that is. So with this bridge, you don't need to drain the canal. Oh, that's great. I don't know. All right. Yeah, what's the footings are in place. They can do it with a crane and then establish utilities, and that's there. Okay. That's right. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's just brings up another question. Um, Peter, you mentioned that there's procedure in disassembling the current bridge and putting this bridge in where will the lines go in the meantime how will we deal with that so the lines will remain on the existing bridge they will then come in and assemble this bridge and then they will attach the lines to the underside of this bridge or maybe they're already there depending on how far they hang down um, and then they will excavate um, behind this bridge, um, we'll put sleeves in through the abutments. So they'll, you know, there's a pipe through the abutments and then we'll slide the two ductile iron pipes for the sewer force main and the water through that, connect them up. And then we will transfer sewer and water to the pedestrian bridge. And then at that point, we will proceed to demolition the existing concrete arch. 
And that's the point at which the canal will not be, it'll be, have water in it, but it will not be generating power because we will need to put divers, a barge, cranes in the water, and anything that goes in the water now ends up in the trash rack. So that's when we would have to shut the canal down, which is why it's a high cost because the, we, we, the town, needs to pay back Great River Hydro for the loss of producing power. Which is why that was originally in your 2027, I believe, right? Is it that in your construction schedule, roughly? Yep. yep. And the point that we've made to Great River Hydro and we'll make through the FERC process is they have to do maintenance on those walls, on those canal walls. It makes no sense that we can't coordinate that over the next four years and make that happen so that we don't have to pay an outrageous amount of money because they're going to have to fix those walls anyway. And so, you know, we've asked them, and I know BHP's asked them, and their initial reaction, like most questions, is no. Then we have to go through this federal relicensing process to maybe help get to yes. So, because it's a benefit to us both. So, are we supposed to decide right now whether we're going to paint it or not? You don't go to. I mean, that's up to Bob, but technically, no, we really don't need to know that for a while, but it would be good to know moving forward, I guess, just for everyone's knowledge. But no, you don't have to make a decision now, but we will need to know shortly as um, we'll need to put, uh, you know, we need to specify the bridge and what the coatings are, because that information helps us get a cost from the pre the fabricator, right? And they're going to want to know, is it Galvi and painted or is it Galvi, galvanized or painted? And so that that would be the issue is as we develop our costs for the construction of this project, that's when we would need to know, which will be happening, I don't know, midsummer. Does it cost us any more to have it galvanized and painted? Not not in this case, uh, since the the funding for this project uh, construction is all the town has does not have a share in the construction cost of this project um, with the exception of the soils right 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 yeah any any participating costs the the town does not have a share in which does not include um the right-of-way costs contaminated soils and uh the the design so, yeah. is there any point in delaying the decision or do it or should we do it now people do is it, will more information emerge I think Walter wanted, at one point I saw Walter up there wanting to comment. Yes, thank you. Can people hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay, great. Um, as the CLG coordinator, I'm very much interested in uh, the uh, matter of uh, conserving the historic landscape of that area. And I just want to ask a question, Scott, getting back to some, to some of your initial comments um, about that coating on the bridge that's along the top of the screen shot that I see in front of me. Yep. That particular bridge, parenthetically, if I can say, is a very, 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 it, it bears a very close resemblance to the bridge that was in place there in the 1880s, in the early 1890s. And from a historic preservation point of view, in terms of landscape, that is a beautiful looking bridge. What was your comment about that bridge uh, in its coating? Uh, yeah, so my comment was yeah. that this is weathering steel. So what it means is weathering steel is a steel that you don't treat. It develops a patina and the patina protects it. But in this case, um, if you're going to use any sort of calcium chloride salt on the bridge, it will mm -hmm. destroy the weathering steel very quickly. The city of Montpelier had a weathering steel bridge over the Nooski River. They salted it and it really, I mean, when I say reduce it, I mean, they were having issues, Bob, what, like five, 10 years in of the lifespan of a bridge that should have given them way longer, like 75 years. So because you're gonna salt it, we're not gonna use the weathering steel. And the other reason is you're you're probably within less than 10 feet of the water. And so F Federal Highway Administration says that any structure that's within 10 feet of the water you're not allowed to use weathering steel. And that's because weathering steel needs to dry out. So it needs to, it's fine getting wet, but then it needs the sun and the air to remove that moisture from it. And if it's within 10 feet, it can't dry out and then it rusts. So okay, that was my you. point thank is that your bridge is going to look like this, but it's going to either have the color of the bridge in the lower left, or it would have another color of your choosing that has a federal color chip, which is pretty, that's a large amount of colors. 
I'm okay, still. So, yeah, yeah, and 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 thank you very, thank you very much for that uh, uh, very detailed explanation, and uh, uh, it's fully understood. I just so it's possible then for us to think about that top bridge um, as pictured in a galvanized. Uh, finish or with another painting finish on top of that. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. That that was exactly my question because I think that that top ridge is just a beautiful rendition of of um, and replacement for the historic landscape. Uh, and it's great to hear that that um, that could be used. Let's say with a galvanized uh, finish on it. Okay. Thank you. So I guess the answer is we don't need an answer today, but we would like one soon. And I don't know that, I mean, unfortunately, I'm not sure we've ever, we can ask Contact. So Contact is the manufacturer who generally provides these bridges. They're a prefabricated bridge. And so we definitely uh, have a contact there and we can reach out to them and see if they've ever repainted a bridge. I don't think they have. Um, but we can certainly try to get more information on it and then apply. I mean, it's just tough because we can say it's going to cost, you know, today it's like 500000 to repaint a whole bridge, right? And then we can say, okay, with inflation at a certain rate, 5% compounded annually, what's 25 years from now going to cost? So we can do that. But the trouble is, I don't know what your maintenance really is going to be, right? So, um, I mean, I think all we're trying to say is understand that if you leave it galvanized, you have less maintenance concerns. Um, but it's going to look like it's galvanized. If it's if color is really important to you, just understand that, yes, we can paint it whatever color you would like within reason, um, but you're going to have to uh, burden some additional maintenance costs further down the road that you wouldn't have to take on. And it'll definitely be, it'll be in the hundreds of thousands. So um, I just don't see how it wouldn't be. Just working over the canal itself, there's just a lot of risk. So. Well, from my perspective, at uh, my age, I'm not going to be around to pay for the bridge uh, if it has to be repainted. So I, I kind of agree. I think I stick with a galvanized myself. Uh, less maintenance, I think, to be the board that was uh, famous for putting a hundred thousand, or five hundred thousand, or a million dollars on the backs of the future people of this uh, community. So that's my point. I really want to see it painted, but that's pretty scary. If it wasn't over a canal and all of the power dam issues that could happen, if God forbid, if you're sandblasting it and your containment system fails and that gets into the works of that canal, I mean, that power building, it's more than a million. Yeah. Yeah. If it was anywhere else, I'd maybe, you know, be more partial. I mean, I, I like the painted look too, but I think it's all of the issues of where it's located and handing a bill to our great grandchildren at this point. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I don't want to be famous for saying, boy, you guys stuck it for a million bucks, but pay the bridge. I mean, we'd have to start stocking away money now. <laughs> I had to agree uh, with what's been said. And I also envision them, you know, snow plows, salt, and it can look like hell. The paint job could be really not very attractive. Very quickly. No, and, and if you try and repaint well, splotches here and there, it's just like you got paint, paint tubs just to cover up a little spot. Yeah. And the new paint's going to look better than the old paint that's already starting to fade. So it's going to look like a pinto pony by the time you get done. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, this is really disappointing. I'd like to see it painted. I'd really like to see it painted. I would far rather see it painted myself personally. I think I my single looks uh, horrible. Is it possible to have a local volunteer crews spray paint it black? And wouldn't doesn't spray paint last a lot longer? No. Doesn't. No, spray paint doesn't last any longer than regular paint they put on. Because yeah, when they use when they use when they use the spray paint, they do high pressure paint spraying, and that embeds the paint into the material. If you're using cans of spray paint from the local hardware store, you might as well forget it. Well, it's not going to come it up from that. But. It's a tough location to maintain. Yeah. And so the costs are really significant, way out of 
way out of what you would normally anticipate for regular maintenance. So mm -hmm. it's a lot yeah. of little poles and things to go yeah. 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 Well, I don't know. It's kind of heartbreaking to me. Mr. Fox, you have your yes. hand up. Yeah. So um, is it is it true that the galvanizing will stop it from? I mean, is there a difference in time frame with a galvanized than not? Yes. I'm sorry, what, what's the, as far as the duration of? Yeah, he was wondering about the duration of galvanizing. I mean, I don't know what your thoughts are on that, Bob, but I would say good 75 years, right? If not more, with Galvi. Yeah, I, you know, it's hard to predict the future, but we, like I said, we, we do not, the state does not paint new bridges unless there's uh, an extenuating circumstance that requires it but it's we uh we we avoid it at all costs just knowing the, the shorter maintenance cycle for for painted bridges so yeah we could we could tell you 75 years i mean it's, it's hard to say but it's just it's just a, a so much more durable coating and um yeah the, I mean, the other thing on Sorry, go ahead. Just one other thing I wanted to mention. We do have a number of galvanized steel vehicular trusses throughout the state, and they do tend to sort of dull over time, I would say. that It's not it's not like you're going to have this shiny silver bridge out there, uh, like, like some galvanized hardware and, and things like that look like. It does, it does uh, tend to dull and not be as um, sort of as much as an eyesore as, as some other galvanized steel you may have may have seen. Um, we can give you some locations if anybody's interested in, in checking that out of some steel trusses that have been around for for a while. You know, there's one in Jamaica on Route 100. It's been been there for about 20 years, I think, just to get an idea of what it'll look like over time. Can you pull up the chat so we can see it on the side? Because there's quite a lot of discussion and I've only kind of popped up for a second. I'm missing it. If you can slide it over to the you know, to the side of the screen. It sort of gets in the way. Yeah, well, just so we can run through the questions because there was, uh, uh, who cares? Yeah, happy birthday, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say the bridge on Route 100 in Jamaica, it does, it does blend. It's not this bright, shiny aluminum thing. I mean, I don't know. So this is one in, I think, Warren, it's south of Waitsfield on Vermont Route 100, and that was done, it's been a while. I was much younger, that much I do know. Um, so this is a this is a prefabricated vehicular truss similar to the one I was showing on the bottom, and you can see this is galvanized, um, and you can see that the guardrail and it has you know it's, it's definitely not shiny. So just for a comparison of how galvi or galvanizing fades with time. Do you want to come back to this, or do you want to want to vote tonight? Pardon? Do you want to vote tonight, or come back to this? Uh, if anyone have any other questions, I mean, it looks like we kind of beat the pain and stuff up until we make a decision. There was a question on the chat. I thought if we don't paint it now, but we can we paint it in twenty five years? Yeah. Yeah, it would be the still, still be very expensive. Right. Yeah. It would still be. It would be. I as I did talk with our with our steel fabrication engineer a couple months ago when the when the question came up and with he told me that with galvanizing it's ideal to paint it as soon as possible after it's after it's dipped. I think over time it it releases. Um, I, I'm not sure what what 
it does or, or develop some sort of um, scaling on the surface or something that would would make the bond of the paint a little more uh, difficult. So not saying that it can't be done. Um, however, there might be some additional surface prep to clean it and, and get it ready instead of just going going ahead and painting it, um, which they could do with the new bridge. I think they, they galvanize it, probably do some light surface prep and then paint it, where if it's been out there for 25 years, it would probably, I don't know if they would have to sandblast it to, to get a, a good surface profile for the paint to, to bond to. Um, but I would say it's possible. It's just maybe a little more difficult yes. doing it up front. Why do it? Because you could get painted now, and if you're going to paint again in 25 years anyways, it's still the same cost, right? There's no, the town isn't expending any money to paint the bridge at this point. So it's really the but, future cost. So why? I mean, I, yeah, I think, I think if the, now? if the town changed, you know, if the town changes its mind in 25 years and wanted to paint it, I think the answer to the question is yes, that could definitely be done. Yeah, you could do it, but. If the town decided to paint it now when there's no cost, and then in 25 years decided to just remove the paint, what would be the cost of removing? That's a good point. Basically, take it off. Yeah, yeah the challenge is the environmental impact in the, on the canal. Right. And right. then he said it would damage the galvanizing right. when you're sandblasting. Yeah, right. And yeah, I think if you paint it, you're sort of committed to maintaining it being painted. Yep. Okay, are we ready to move on to the handicap parking design options? Uh, we have one. I, I made multiple slides. So the next one was talking about the vehicular bridge. Sorry, I know you're burnt out on coatings, but um, one more and then we can move on. Okay. okay. So I guess on this one, we just wanted to show. Um, in this case, this bridge is, Kelly, 176 feet long, close to that. Anyways, um, the, the longest tank we have in Massachusetts for dipping is only 90 feet. So, or is it, six? sorry, it's 60 feet, but you can do up to 90 feet because you can dip one side and then you dip it the, you know, you dip it the other way. Um, but it would bridge this long, we would do something that's called metallizing. So, Unlike painting, they it's they take a galvanized or a zinc-based paint, but they run current through the beam, and there's this you know negative electron looking for the positive ion or whatever. And they I don't know it was chemistry; it was a long time ago, but they made they made up. So it's a more uh, it's better than painting. Um, it's more like hot dip galvanizing durability wise. So as Bob noted, if VTrans cannot hot dip galvanize their bridge, they will metallize their bridge to protect it, and so. We just wanted to show you some pictures. One of these is on Vermont Route. Actually, it's a town road next to the New Haven, over the New Haven River in New Haven. And the other one, Bob, was Brandon. I think this Bradford, is Brandon. 20, Bradford. Yeah, yeah, so I honestly don't remember which is which, but this is the underside of the one in New Haven. I do know that. So we just wanted to show these because I know there was talk about wanting to paint this. And our thought was, regardless of what you do with the pedestrian trust, trust because most of the structure is above the grid, like it's very visible. All this is gonna be below the concrete deck. And so we would strongly recommend that this one not be painted and simply be metalized for durability because um, one, it's gonna be closer to the canal. So you have less clearance and the cost, it's a longer bridge. Well, yeah, it is a longer bridge because it's on an angle. So it's just a significantly more expensive thing to take on. And so I don't, I don't aesthetically, you know, You'll see it downstream, I guess, looking upstream from the pedestrian bridge, but otherwise you're not really going to have a visual of this structure. So, And the, this, again, it's just it's a dull gray coating, and we use it where we can't use weathering steel due to the, uh, the clearance above water, which is the issue here. Correct. So we just wanted to show what that would look like. I don't see if there were any concerns from a distance. It, sort of looks like concrete, but just wanted to, that's that's what we were intending to do for a coating here and wanted to see if there were any concerns about that. that if not, that kind of looks better than the galvanized. <laughs> yeah, well, it, metallizing the pedestrian bridge, well, the, the downside to doing that is you don't get the coating inside of the, the tubes. 
where where with hot with dipping it with galvanizing it's you're dropping the truss into a, a bath of molten zinc so it finds every little nook and cranny in there and coats it where this is a spray applied application which is fine for a for a steel girder like this since you can access everything um but much more durable than a three coat paint system. And those will be painted, free painted before they got on site, correct? correct? Yes. So there's no issues as far as, you know, contamination and all that. So we talked about on head, head beard. Right, yep. Okay. Anyone? All right, we're all set for this one. Are we ready to move along to the uh, uh, handicapped options. Probably. Yeah. So, um, Scott, real quick, there's a. I know there's a comment in the chat about the graffiti removal, um, and yeah. and I, I think we did speak to that. Um, I don't know offhand what's involved with that removing it from a galvanized coating. I can say that it's uh, it's likely not possible to remove it from a painted coating without damaging it somehow. Um, that's something we can look into what's involved in removing it from galvanizing. I know there is a coating we can put on concrete that makes graffiti to, to be removed uh, more easily. It's like a silicone coating. I don't know if you can put that on steel, um, potentially, but we have used it on concrete abutments for ease of graffiti removal, um, but it's pretty expensive and it makes the concrete really dark as well, a very dark gray. When you put that coating on it, so um, something we can look into if if that if the town would like us to um, the process for removing graffiti from galvanizing. Well, I guess maybe if uh, the graffiti on the galvanizing would be painted. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the graffiti artist would have to be standing on the water in some way to get at this, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, you say that, but you'd be surprised how people can hang. I don't know. People do amazing things, things all the time. So they go places that I would not want to crawl up on a bridge. So um, you never know. But yes, in theory, you and I, well, I mean, there is land here, so they could easily get to this part of the structure, but then they yes, ask it's over that. But, you know, like I said, it's crazy what they will tag, even on the interstate where you're like, why and how? So. Okay. All right. Yeah. So moving ahead to long-term parking. So this is the existing condition. So currently there's a sound a sign here that says, you know, you can only park from midnight to 7 a.m. with the exception of these four spaces located here. And I guess just to put perspective, um, right there is the welcome center. That's the point of the welcome center. And then here is the New England Central track. Uh, Amtrak station or whatever the platform is located here. And then GMRC comes in through here. So these are the closest spaces basically to accessing the train. And I believe there is a bus drop off over in here or there's signs for that. I don't know if the bus still comes or not. I think you told us it does not, but if that were to resume. So the idea is that um, we met with VTrans Rail and Aviation. They are obviously working on a platform project here. And they noted that they, they currently have four, you, the town, have four spaces, two of which are accessible. And in our plan, we weren't really making a plan to address that issue. And they really want us to keep those spaces in close proximity. So based on what you have today, we developed the two options. So option one is parallel parking, where we have uh, seven parallel parking spaces along here. And we would simply take the signs that you have today and put one here behind the sidewalk and one here. And these would be the non-accessible stocks. And then again, Welcome Center is right down here. And I don't know if you can see my mouse. So let me know if I'm just talking to myself and pointing at things. Um, but, okay. Um, and then the idea would be that the, um, the accessible spaces that are next to the um, electric charging spaces um, between the Welcome Center and New England Central would become those um, long-term accessible spaces. And then the parking spaces that are between the canal and the entrance to the Welcome Center would then be transferred from non-accessible to accessible spaces. And I guess, not sure, I wrote this down just so I can remember if you asked me, but 
with this configuration, you are basically, you are always losing spaces on the island because we're obviously putting a road through one of the bays. But with the addition of the parking spaces on Canal Street, you have a net loss of four parking spaces total with this. And um, to sort of show this graphically, so here's the spaces that we would turn into accessible long-term spaces. And then the idea is, if you move to the next slide, this is the front of the Welcome Center, and these two spaces here would become accessible. They're not today. And then this would be your hatched area, and we would make them van accessible. Um, and this area is most likely within the course milling we're going to perform, which means we are going to grind the pavement down and put in new pavement. Not sure that we're really fully into this area, but it is just driving signs. Um, and even though I show this one here, it should be behind the sidewalk as this one is shown. So that would be something that would be easy to do. Um, and then we could obviously add paint because they should be freshened up. So that is option one. And then the, the next option is just thinking about parking in general and the desire to keep all four spaces in generally the same place. So this area just to the right of the yellow highlighted areas where they are today, we would have a diagonal set of spaces, 11 total. And four of those would be dedicated to um, long-term parking with two of the four being accessible spaces. So pretty much the same as was before. And with this configuration, again, if we put 10 parking spaces on Canal Street, as we're sh currently showing, um, you really have a net loss of zero parking spaces over the entire project. Um, so that was the question, which one does the board prefer or the town? I and I guess one. this one? As as, yeah, All as right. long as there's safety issues with that one, that closest one backing out. Right. So to avoid those issues and to create site distance, we are going to try to eliminate not eliminate, but reduce plantings in the site distance area to something that isn't that tall. So any trees would be further back to give good sight distance for vehicles turning. And then we specifically, you know, we could have added more right through this area, but we didn't because we want good distance between this person backing out and this person coming around the corner. Um, as you noted, the parallel would be the safest. Um, we long time ago, we were showing uh, perpendicular spaces, which would not be the safest because you're backing out diagonally with a, or sorry, straight back. With these, you're backing out diagonally. So it allows you to look behind your right shoulder uh, easier and then you just back out and at 25 miles an hour with I think it was 590 average daily traffic it should not be an issue um, but to your point we do not have traffic stopping coming from the island as it heads back to Canal Street because of the railroad crossing we wouldn't want anything you know stopping here so this is a safer issue and like I said site distance wise we can make sure that any plantings vegetation are below the Three foot level, which allows your eye to see incoming traffic. A question: Are, are you including way, the waypoint center parking in your total parking spaces? No, because I'm not removing any of the waypoint center parking spaces. So that is a good point. Um, if we go back, I just I don't know if I took, but you, it's not like we're we're adding or reducing any waypoint parking spaces, but we are changing two into accessible spaces that were not accessible spaces before. Um, that would be the change. So one uh, person has counted about 30 spaces, including the, the uh, handicapped spaces in the waypoint. So that should probably be included in our total because it's walkable. I mean, it's, you know, three seconds, five seconds, eight second walk right. across that road. So as we contemplate what the net impact of this will be, it's, uh, I think we have to include the waypoint parking spaces because they're pretty, they're used, I think, interchangeably. Right, but I guess to point that out, you had 79 in the area that the project is impacting, not counting the waypoint center. Um, and we're putting 65 back and we are losing one on Canal Street, but adding 11, so there's a 10 there. So we have 75, so 79 minus 75 gives you four spaces. So the net total, would be, I guess, a loss of four. And then you could argue that in theory, you're, you, you're losing two non-accessible spaces because now you're adding these in here because you took these for um, parking. But normally we don't really look at a six accessible spaces as losing parking. They're just designated for a different purpose, right? So, um, and the reason we do that is because they're different. So there's rules for ADA. And so if we're gonna use these, basically say that you can't park here unless you're parking overnight. We need to 
provide at least two spaces because that's what you had before. One comment about uh, those spaces right there. Uh, those are not near any um, accessible entrance to the Waypoint Center building. That's a good point. I assume, and I didn't look, so thank you that because there was hatching here, this was an, an accessible entrance, but There's I can make it accessible because it looks like the curb is pretty low. So, and this is a larger slab. So normally you would go up on a one on 12 for ADA, but you can go steeper. Well, I guess that's 12%. Yeah, you can go as steep as 12%, but you normally would do five. So I, I feel like that is something we could absolutely make happen with the removal of some concrete and, and herb and then the replacement of it. But that's a good point. That's additional um, work that would have to be performed if we go with this route. Um, whereas this route, um, this is the limits of our course milling in here um, that we would be doing. And we're also doing some work further down in here of removing spaces for the addition of a, a guide wire off a utility pole. But really we're just, course milling, which means we're taking away inch and a half of pavement followed by three inches of pavement. And then we just pave it all back and restripe everything as it is today. And then, you know, the modifications happen here. So these spaces next to the uh, charging station, we don't touch them at all as part of this project. They stay just like they are. So. <laughs> So I heard one vote for this option and I get two, three. I don't well, here's, a, here's a question. If you go with those um, diagonal spaces, can you add a, a little green strip on the opposite side of the street where there would have been parallel spaces? So um, I guess to be clear, sidewalk is here. And then this is all green back here. Yeah, on the other side. On this side? Yep. This side has parallel spaces here. Could we remove those? Yes, if you did not want them. Well, no, what I'm asking is, would you still have the parallel spaces there if you do those diagonal spaces? Yeah, no, it'll look exactly like it does today. So you'll have 11 diagonal here, two accessible, Two with the long, you know, within the long-term parking signs, and then these, I think it's seven as well, parallel spaces here. All right, thanks for the clarification. Well, you still have the width for the parallel on the other side. Yeah. Well, doesn't look like it in the drawing. Got it. Go back to the one with the that shows parallel on both sides. It's just we're moving the sidewalk closer to the tracks to the to the north. Yeah, so I guess the way to look at this is you can see this current bump out um, right here. And then if we were to go, so you see the existing bump outs are just barely into the sidewalk. And if you go back to here, the bump outs are past the sidewalk into the parking spaces. So all we did is move the sidewalk further to the, I guess that would technically be East New Hampshire towards the tracks. So this one actually has a lot more parking spaces because you still have seven <clears throat> parallel and you can still park from either direction on the bridge. Yes. yes, mm -hmm. although it's a little more challenging to do this, but uh, you know, to come from the bridge and turn left, but you absolutely can. You just have to cut it a little more, but yes. So, yep. I mean, if you're, you're coming from uh, up, up in town down the bridge, you could just parallel park on the right. In that yes, direction. that's correct. Yep. So that is the option with more parking spaces. Yes. And more spaces for the train station if there's going to be businesses in there. Yeah. Yes. I like, I like, I like this, this one. Me too. I like this one. Yeah. That's better. All right. So this is the one we're going to proceed with then, and we will sign it um, as noted here with the train bus long term parking only, notify police. So, all right. Would the would the town like to keep just four spots designated for long term parking, or do you? Well, I think for now, until they offer the second potential uh, Vermonter run, I think okay. we're, we're back. And it's you can expand. move signs as as they You can do whatever you want with your signs. Yeah, you just so feel like it. We'll just keep it as the four. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you.
You can also ask All right. in case people use it. Right. Yeah. So I, I, I see that, and there's those are never uh, they're they're always used, but they're never full with people coming into the train station saying there's no you know there's no long term parking. It's the right amount for the current service. Okay. And I guess I don't know if so. As you can see, our sidewalk goes towards the train station and stops, and they're still a conceptual with the work they're doing on the Antrac platform, but we have been told by Stantec and VTrans Rail and Aviation Bureau, Stantec being the design consultant, that they are gonna meet our sidewalk and put a pen crossing across the railroad track. So I think you're gonna have way better access, which means maybe people would be more inclined to utilize this parking area to access. I mean, new platform, new, I mean, it's just gonna be more inviting to people to park here and use. So I think that is also going to improve, um, but they're obviously on their schedule and we're on our schedule. So someday we'll all it'll all be done. On that previous drawing, um, yeah, at the that T intersection, you show a crosswalk. Yeah. Uh, on the other drawing, it showed crosswalks going the other way as well. Yes, and that's because after talking with the VTrans Rail and Aviation. Right now you have a sidewalk right here that's on that side and we are going to eliminate that sidewalk because it's a sidewalk to nowhere. And so the thought process is that everyone, let's say you park at the um, the uh, charging station behind between New England Central and the, the Waypoint Center. The thought process is we're gonna have a sidewalk that goes right through the text that says four long-term spaces, two of which will be long-term accessible spaces. So. You're gonna walk through there and then you're gonna turn and go to your right and go across like at station 808 plus 00, which is sort of behind that crosswalk. And then this side continues onward and goes to the train station, whereas the other side is, is not a sidewalk to anywhere. So better to eliminate it and have everyone walk on the crosswalk and on the preferred pedestrian route. And it's not like it's any longer or shorter, right? There's no real advantage to walking along the side of the road when you can, you know, go that way. So that's why we did that. And it also assists us, allows us to sort of move some lines over. So for trucks turning, if you're coming across the bridge from the left and you're at this stop sign and you have to go, you know, turn left, it gives the tractor trailers more room to make that corner um, without in what we call encroaching on oncoming traffic. So mm -hmm. AKA means that if you're coming the other way, there's a tractor trailer in your lane and that doesn't make you happy. I mean, it's not unsafe because obviously you'll see it happening. You can stop, it's 25, but I think it's a safer way. And I think defining a, a known pedestrian route is really going to improve. Like having that thing go there and no real crossing, I don't think is, you know, the railroad doesn't want that because now you got pedestrians not crossing where you intend them. So by making a true defined route, you're really improving safety for everyone, the users, the train, the pedestrians and, and vehicular traffic. Well, to that point, um, in the future, we probably will have a sidewalk on that side because, you know, we are intending to make improvements to Island Street uh, coming up in the future as part of the area-wide plan. So we would have a continuous sidewalk on that side. Okay. Um, I was thinking too. <laughs> yeah, there, there's also a potential uh, Greyhound bus um, uh, stop spot on that in that spot on the um on yes. that side. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean we can if you would like us to put that back in, we can actually do that and just end it and um we'll direct I, I, I think we'll need to talk with the with the with our we've been coordinating on the rail platform project, but I don't I don't think from a safety standpoint if they're not putting a sidewalk on both sides of the road, which I don't believe they're intending to do. Um, directing, just dead ending a sidewalk there. Um, yeah, it's not good but, practice. But we'll we'll look into it, but I think from a safety standpoint, um, we may we may not that may not be a safe option. Just to sort of build out the sidewalk for the future if the crossing is not going to be set up for it. But we'll coordinate with them and and. See if that's a possibility. It sounded like it wasn't, which is why we eliminated those those two uh, right. crossings. But yeah, because it also wouldn't be a safe crossing across the the tracks. You wouldn't yeah, have that. Right there. Um, but would you have uh, would you have a crosswalk 
on that side of the tracks from the station to where the Greyhound bus was, or would that be part of the station project? So right now our sidewalk ends at essentially that existing um, chain link fence. And then the intent is, you know, we share our plans with the people working on the station project and they start their sidewalk where we end ours and they continue towards the top of the page uh, to the Amtrak. So what they're gonna do is they will have the sidewalk continue along um, at seven inches and then they drop it seven inches when it gets to the railroad crossing. And then what would happen is they will pave the length of the railroad crossing and then they usually, um, so the idea is the concrete stops, you walk across the pavement, which is extended further to the left to account for that sidewalk. And then depending on what there you're doing, you would either continue to a concrete sidewalk or it would go into the platform, either or. But that would be the, the gist of it. And the idea is that there's a gate. Um, yeah, and I don't know what they would do with gates because the vehicular gate is coming down on the right side of the road, so there's no ped gate. So in theory, they should be adding a ped gate as part of their project, but we can talk to them about that. So to Bob's point, I think the idea is to sort of um, guide pedestrians to cross the tracks where we want them to, so we know they're crossing at the safest point. Um, and that's why he's sort of hesitant to to put in a sidewalk to nowhere. Like we usually do not put in, like that is standard, like do not put a sidewalk to nowhere because that's what happens is people walk on it and if there's no future planned use of it. So. Well, I think that that's what Elijah was saying is that in the future, is plan. we do want to have, <clears throat> I think we talked about. Right, right, and I guess agree, but I think what we're saying is that would be part of your project to come in and install it. And the, the issue is, we just need to coordinate with the rail and aviation folks because they need to make their crossing long enough so that there is a surface across the railroad tracks that's level with the roadway so you can continue that sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And right now they told us, no, all pedestrians are crossing on the side, one side, not both sides. So- And that, and that makes sense, that is safer. And if we're implementing a um, streetscapes and sidewalk on the other side, we would just start the extra 15 feet back at the waypoint. And, right. And we would build it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, safety at the railroad crossings is a, it's a big deal. People definitely die at them. And um, I think this makes sense to go with there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. So we're all set there. All right. So green strip versus no green strip. So, um, I believe, sorry, Ron, right? Did I forget your name already? He's a, you John, uh, just real quick, there was a Thanks. comment. Um, there was a comment from uh, John Jonathan about bike parking. Um, and, and if there is any, and if not, or is there any included as part of this plan? Scott, do you want to speak to that real quick? Yeah, so there is bike parking currently, and we will be putting bike parking back. We just need to coordinate with the town on where that would be. Um, currently, they are um, the bike parking consists of, um, I don't know what the right terminology is, but it would be, just bear with me here. Um, so that is the bike parking right now. Uh, this thing. So we know where those are and we can put those back or we can put back a piece of concrete with a more with like a hoop for bike parking as well. Um, there's all kinds of things we can do for bike parking. We just haven't, I mean, that's, I realize, I mean, that's more of a finite detail that not necessarily is as critical as the larger details, but certainly yes, bike parking could be added anywhere here that the town felt would be reasonable and certainly can be added over by the uh, long-term parking. And, and that will be here. That'll be part of the landscaping plan, which um, is is will be in the works. Once we we needed to really settle the parking layout and um, the question about the the stormwater treatment to to really kick off the landscape design to to know what space we have to work with. So um, that's coming, and it's it's definitely on the radar, but we just haven't got to that stage yet. But yeah, that's a good point. There, we're not showing it, but there is absolutely bike parking because it's there today. All right. So sorry, Rick, I called you Ron. I hope that's not the guy you hated in high school. So now you're really <laughs> mad. Fine, I answered almost anything. <laughs> <laughs> 
So um, do, you, do you mind? I'm uh, the liaison with the Walk Bike Committee, and we have three members of the Walk Bike Committee here tonight. And um, you and I have been corresponding about the possibility of a linear park green space here. And I wanted to uh, make uh, make our little pitch first. I won't be long, and then and then you can just when you can share some of the correspondence we've had. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. So public views of water. A lot of cities and towns <laughs> around the country are saying this. It's a it's a tremendous asset. It adds value um, to pedestrians and residents' experiences of a place. And we happen to have this beautiful view um, out toward the, the canal. And then with uh, in the distance, the Connecticut River. So our thought of the Walk Bike Committee is that we take these on Canal Street, which is now going to be one way northbound. And I was out there measuring today, there's 24 feet from the fence canal fence to the edge of the sidewalk. And um, given the, uh, the space we have available, uh, our contention would be that a, uh, a green space with some shrubbery, apparently trees, I've been Scott, you, we were, uh, Scott Burbank, you and I corresponded trees, there you go. Trees don't seem to be an option because there's not enough room, but benches and a, um, a walkway. You can see that's what, what we would like to propose. And I know the big question is parking spaces. There are no parking spaces there now whatsoever on either side. So that's where we are now. And the, uh, if we have 64 spaces in the lots and we have, uh, we're in, and then we have about 30 spaces in the waypoint, that gives us about 94 possible parking places, including handicapped spaces. And there are now 79, I guess, so I don't think we're going to have a net loss of parking spaces. So I noticed that you've included parking spaces on Canal Street on the eastern side. And we, and tell me, Penny, yeah. this is, we would like to propose that there be a green space there instead of, um, instead of parking places. And I, would anyone else like to add? Um, well, I would just add that uh, I, I used to live in Exeter Block there, so I spent a lot of time here moving through or looking at uh, both of those parking lots, Waypoint and Depot lot parking lot, never, ever full. Never. And a friend of mine who still lives in Exeter Block uh, said even, even on the 4th of July when like herds of people go down there, watch the fireworks, it's still not full, she said. And so I just don't know why losing a piece of I guess, Scott, pick up. Do you know, I thought I heard that the Bellas Falls garage parking area is not going to have enough parking spaces for all the tenants, but I don't recall. What, so that could be, I could be very much wrong on that, but did you hear something that familiarity? Because that was one of the things that sort of pushed us to look at adding parallel parking here was to allow people to park here and then walk to the Bells Falls garage complex. But is that a true That's, statement or am I incorrect on that? It's true. Um, they have, I think, 12 near the building and there's 27 apartments. Yeah, 20 27. Yeah. So yeah, they, there is a need for additional parking. They will be giving parking permits to people in the building as, as part of their rent. Um, and it would be well, they can park in any any of our parking lots. Yeah, they can park across the the canal, obviously. Um, and I guess just to be clear on the parking, the seventy nine does not include the what do you say the thirty for the um, welcome center. So the seventy nine is what's uh, like across the road from the welcome center. So um, I'm not saying you know, like you said, you are losing parking, but if people aren't using, if you're if you're not at capacity, then does it matter, I guess, is the way to say it. But I think it's important to note that, you know, 79 is, is what's there today across the road from the Welcome Center, not including the parking spaces at the Welcome Center. But again, if no one's parking, you don't, you're not at capacity, then it's kind of irrelevant, but just to be clear. And I also think, sorry, the benches. Um, so the way they're shown here is they're right at the edge of what presumably would be a sidewalk, so a five foot width. And typically benches, we like to have a minimum of three to two feet back because the idea is that if someone were sitting here with a stroller, 
We don't want people who are walking to be impeded by that stroller or their legs hanging off or the person talking to them. So I don't think benches would be viable simply because this bench would be against the edge of the curb or pavement, depending on which way you would like to go. And so just sitting in a bench with cars going by at 25 miles an hour, I'm not sure. I mean, we can certainly put them in, but I just don't know so how often they would be truly used. Um, but again, that would be a town decision as well. But they're just, so I measured 23 feet uh, to the fence. And I guess it's important to note that the fence is, the right-of-way line is before the fence up by the corner um, where you come around Canal Street and it's exactly at the fence by the existing bridge. But I assume we could acquire those rights from the uh, uh, canal from Great River Hydro. So I, I was measuring 23 feet. And the reason for that is the sidewalk today, I don't know if it's four feet or five feet, but it doesn't have a six inch granite curb. And when we're done, it will have, so let's say it's five feet. So the sidewalk will then go to from just five feet to five foot six, five feet of sidewalk, six inch thickness on the granite curb. So that's probably where we're sort of losing some space. So your thought is that bushes uh, rather than trees and uh, benches don't make sense? Is that, is that, is that right? Because all these trees are going to die because you're going to salt this road and there isn't much plant matter that is resistant to salt. And there's not enough room for the tree root ball to spread out in four feet. So it, 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 it basically, you can plant a tree, but you're either going to have to cut it down. The other thing is, as it grows, its branches are going to overhang the roadway. And so you're going to have to trim them. It's just, it's not advisable. I mean, you can do it, but I, I just think it's a waste of money because the trees really aren't going to be healthy and viable in this condition because of the minimum space, which what I was saying is per our discussions with the uh, public works, they want 14 feet curb to curb in order to get their snowplow maintenance through here. So if we have 23 feet minus 14, that basically leaves you with nine, maybe nine, six, because it's nine plus or minus. So if this is a five foot sidewalk minimum, right, you wouldn't go any less than that, then you have four feet of green space. And if you push this bench two feet back, then the bench is on the edge. And then the, the other thing is we wouldn't have this sidewalk be raised because literally the grade just drops right off here. So this sidewalk would have to be at the same elevation as the pavement is today, but we could put a curb along between the road and the green strip and then just have it slope down because sloping of it, you know, sloping down seven inches over four feet is going to work fine. It's a very gradual slope. And so that's the concern is it's more likely going to be a piece of grass that you have to mow that's four feet wide. And yes, you could put in shrubs and stuff, but because of the salt, you're going to want to put something in that can resist that, which they just limits you. Will cars fit then, given what you're describing, how is there room for, uh, how, how wide is the parking space? 10 feet. But the parking space sticks out further than this curb. So in other words, this is 14 feet, there's nine feet, this is 10 feet. So it's really only 13 feet. But when you plow the road, you have a band in winter. So all the cars are gone, right? You're required to remove them. So they have, you know, 23 feet to plow here along here, and then they come back down to 14 and off they go. So that's why it works. We've got a hand up, Scott. Uh, Sharon, you can go ahead. Um, can you hear me? Yep. yep. It, it, you're talking about removing parking spots on Canal Street. Is it anywhere near my business? It's immediately across from where you have that ramp and the stone. It's the very one closest to the um, bridge. That one gets removed in order to allow the sidewalk to access the pedestrian bridge. And then there's no more removed from that location up to the square. But how will I have access to get trucks in and out? I mean, are you talking about the sidewalk coming out into the street? Because right now at the yes. end of that street, there is no parking. Correct. So we are going to thin that down to be 14 feet wide. So the trucks would come from the right and then turn in and back in, presumably, to your shop. They would come from from uh, LaFoe's square. side? No, they'd have to come from the square because this whole road is now one way back towards um, Rockingham Street. So the road is currently, as you know, is one way from the square aka Rockingham Street, down to the existing bridge. With the existing bridge gone, there's no way for traffic to turn around. Like now they can come down and turn onto the existing bridge and cross. But the existing bridge goes away, it becomes a pedestrian bridge. So 
The whole road right, is but one what way. What I'm saying is, in order to back into my business right now, I go on the bridge and back in. So I will right. no longer be able to back into my property. That is correct. Although we can probably look at some way to make it a mountable curb to allow you to do that. Because I'm assuming that happens daily. Not daily, but it happens frequently. It's just, uh, you know, already with everything that's going on down there now, my business is non-existent. But I mean, you're just making my building, really, it should be residential rather than commercial because you're not going to be able to run a business there. I mean, we could we could talk to you about it, and I'm assuming these are semis, not box trucks. They're not semis. They're like oh. you know pickup trucks with trailers. They're box trucks. They're you know delivery trucks. Every now and then, it is a tractor trailer because they deliver boxes or whatever. But it's just like you, you, this whole project between this and the apartments going up has like pretty much negated my business. So if it's if it's tractor trailers, I mean, in theory, and again, that'd be up to the town, but they could designate the parking spaces by the pedestrian bridge such that they, I mean, it's the same thing they do in the city of Burlington because you don't back into anything. You just pull her out on the side of the road and you unload from the back and take a cart and cross the road. So that would be one way to mitigate that. Um, and then if it's a box truck, I think it could probably back in. Um, a pickup truck with a trailer, they're pretty maneuverable too, but yeah, we could definitely, I mean, that would be up to the town what they want to do there because um, this is their their project, but there are ways to, to mitigate that. So Scott, when we take out the old bridge and we have the abutment area and where the current bridge landing is, that's all at grade at that point? So it's, we well, be, that? it's seven inches above grade, seven inches above the roadway because there'd be a curb there, but you could... You could do things to slope that curb at 45 to allow someone to pull in there, although it's a pedestrian area. So I don't know. We we could talk about it. But I mean, I know like we did a project on uh, 110 and 302 in Barrie where the tractor trailer came to drop off gas. And in order to do it, it had to drive onto the sidewalk. So we just dropped the sidewalk and made it mountable. And they, you know, when they come in the middle of the night or whenever they come to drop off gas, they drive onto the sidewalk, sidewalk and for that you know, half hour, it's not accessible, but then they go away and it's perfectly fine. So there's things you can do. Certainly right, I mean, just... you could, yeah. I mean, we can reduce the space that we're showing here and, and move the sidewalk further. So there's a parking space, you know, a semi foot long parking space right there to access the business. There's, there's all kinds of things we can do to mitigate that. Or like I said, you can, there's plenty of parking on canal street further, you know, past her business as you head back towards the square, right. That you could designate as non, no parking, except for certain hours, right? When there's no deliveries. Another thing we might be able to do that might help would, I see there's a hydrant uh, right yeah, in front of that's, business. I agree. I was gonna talk to you about that. I really, really wanna remove that hydrant and find a new home for it. So yeah, I, I mean, page. it's gonna be doing yeah. water line work there anyway. And I think yeah, it could be moved across the street or wherever yeah. it, it needs to be. But if that's if that's an obstruction that it seems like we could we could relocate that to help. Yeah, I was. It's funny because I was looking at all this and I was like, you know what, the hydrant needs to find a new home. And yeah. so what we were talking about was um, this hydrant right here of getting rid of this because right. this crosswalk now is being pushed down to. So the idea is you would cross here in this green strip, come across, yeah. and then you would walk through here. Um, and then back onto the sidewalk after the pedestrian bridge. bridge. And those signs, the signs won't be there. There's no either. need for this sign to be here. This sign can go away. That sign doesn't need to be there because it's all going this way. So, yeah. So this area would, the idea would be to open this up more. So absolutely agree with all that. Yeah, and that would help alleviate some of the issues of access there. It would be left one less obstruction when trying to pull into that yeah, site. Yeah, because it's literally right here. Yeah, and I, I think we should look yeah. at that, that jog in the edge of pavement there and just, you know. Yeah, I, I would just love to go her. from here, straight line to here, and then, and then to her point, yeah. you could just pull up, back in. 
And if it was a tractor trailer, we could say you can park here or we could make this space smaller than we have it and um, put something in here like that that allows it, something to pull in and unload and traffic can then drive by. I think if you remove that fire hydrant and those signs, it would make it a lot easier. I could pull forward it back in. Yep. Yeah, I don't disagree. And I was going to talk to Bob about those because when I was, I don't remember why, but I was looking at, oh, I was looking at the revised preliminary plans. When I was doing that, I was like, we, we should not be doing this. This should go away. And we got green strip or something. We can, we'll have to talk to the fire department um, and see if there's a spot they would prefer it to be. But I feel like we could relocate it and still provide the fire protection they need from that hydrant. What is, what are, uh, I know that there's, that's like the, I don't know what you call it, the bridge support for the old bridge, that, that big gray rectangle there. Yep. So what that's going to remain, can you say that's going to stay there when they take the bridge, take the bridge down? The viewing platform, is it going to be a viewing platform, is that right? Something there? Yeah, so the it's idea right? is we would have this become a hardscape, aka concrete, um, granite, stone, something, and then there was talk about maybe putting in um, interpretive boards talking about Abnaki history here or here. Um, but the idea is that because the foundation of the arch is integral with the, the canal, that we can remove the arch, but we need to keep the foundation. So the thought process is we would build a retaining wall behind this um, that would be essentially be our coffer dam. Because right now, you know, water stops here, but below that, the arch is what's keeping the water from flowing freely into the soil behind here. Now, it doesn't mean that your groundwater isn't essentially the same as this, but there's there's a physical barrier from letting the water because the arch, you know, the canal goes down at an angle, but the arch comes up, you know, vertically. So in order to do that, we would have to build, we'd have to build something behind here, right? And so the idea is the canal is sloping down here. And then when it got to here, it would be vertical down to an elevation of around 291.1, which is going to be, for Great River Hydro, they were saying that with their FARC permit, 291.1 is 291.1 is going to be their new elevation. So right now, I believe they fluctuate from actually 291.6 to 288.6, but they're predicting in the future 291.1 is the, and I don't know if that's a state secret. So if anyone asks, I never told you that. But um, anyways, the point being is we would build a retaining wall probably back here. Um, because the idea is we have to build this and then we have to come in and we remove the pavement and remove all the material that's the overburden of this arch. And then we got to cut this arch out of here. Um, and then the thought is that we would cut it in strips this way and then slowly remove it because if you cut it this way, it's just going to, you know, if you cut it perpendicular to left to right, it's just going to fall. So this would be some sort of hard, uh, right now it's planned to be some sort of hardscape viewing area where you could sort of come out and stop and look at the, the water. Um, doesn't have to be, but that's been the general consensus on both sides. And again, these are all thoughts and concepts and none of them have been fully vetted any further than just thoughts and concepts. So wouldn't a bench, if we wanna have benches, wouldn't that be the place to have them? Yes, the thought was we'd have some nice granite benches here. I, I haven't really talked in detail with my um, landscape architect, but the idea is yes, this would be a, like sort of a pause place where you could sit and sort of look and look out over the water. Okay. And I have a suggestion for the design of that area. Um, yep. Around the perimeter of the concrete retaining wall, because these will be these will be like platforms that are jutting out into the edge of the canal over the banks. Um, I would suggest that the railing around there should either be the same railing as on the pedestrian bridge or it should be the same design as the railing on the vehicular bridge. Um, rather than continuing the, the steel picket fence, I think that having a, a lower railing, um, like on the bridges, would uh, emphasize that more and make it more into a, a real viewing platform. And it would give you a better view so I guess yeah. just to be clear, it, it isn't going to, well, right now it's not cantilevering over. So it might get smaller or it will get smaller than what we're showing here because we sort of updated it. And maybe it's easier to show you this. Uh, no, PDF, Scott. 
I, I think we can look at, I think there's certainly an opportunity to have some, some different railing options there. It's not, it's not a safety issue from, from a vehicular standpoint. Um, I think it's likely far enough out. So it's outside of the, the clear zone of the roadway. Um, so we, yeah, can, so we can look at something there. That's, you can do whatever you want to do for the railing. I guess just to know. So this is shown here. This is the retaining wall. I have a feeling it's going to get moved back to here. We need to do some more geotechnical here because we've taken some borings and we know that there's this monozone stone and some concrete. We just don't know how far it goes this way. And we, we have to figure out is can we bear on it? Because what happens is with the arch, it's putting thrust. So the arch wants to, to fall down. So it's pushing with force against Canal Street and towards the island, right? And when we take away that force, the concern is, is the foundation then going to want to get pushed by the earth that's on it into the canal, right? Because right now the arch is, for, is pushing out outward away. It's, it's countering that force. But when you take away the arch, there's no more force pushing, you know, away from the canal towards Canal Street and the island. And so is the earth pressure just going to simply push that foundation forward into the canal. So we got to do a little math to figure that out. But the point being is this is going to be some sort of a viewing area. And to your point, we did sort of talk about we could cantilever. Do we want to? And then this fence is simply going to be, I believe this one is four feet, so 48 inches. And this one would have to be what's called a guardrail. So this one is going to have to be 42 inches. So it'll be six inches lower, three, six. Is there, and that's a requirement for, for Ashto in design. And that's so that and it, it also has to be such that you can't fit a four inch sphere uh, through it. And that's so that a baby, a toddler can't sit there and stick their head through it and crawl through and fall. And the 42 is so that when you accidentally fall, it stops you from falling over as well. And uh, I, John, Jonathan, I think you had your hand up first. Yes, uh, it's more about the, uh, the sort of linear park idea. But it sounds like there was a 14 foot travel lane plan, which is pretty wide uh, for a single lane. I hear that, you know, you said, I think that's a town uh, DPW express a, a preference for that. I just wonder if that's an absolute minimum uh, coming from DPW or if that's more of a preference. And, you know, maybe if we could shrink that by a few feet, that would give you uh, the room to, to make a difference, you know, to fit ben benches and trees along that, uh, that walkway. Right. So it was 11 and we corresponded with the gentleman from DPW and basically the thought process is VTrans usually makes all their lane widths 14 feet because that allows the, the plow and the the um, the wing to get through. And they also DPW also noted that a grader goes through here. And so basically the consensus one was that 14 feet would allow them to do what they need to do for winter maintenance and not have them worry about hitting the curb. So Again, that is a town decision. Obviously, the town can do whatever it would like to do, but their DPW person said uh, 14 feet is what we need in order to safely maintain the roadway during winter maintenance. So, again, not. I guess what I'm saying is that's not up to me. That would be up to the town if they want to make that less wide. But part of the reason that we thought, again, thinking about that green strip is that we were concerned that there is no um, sidewalk or, or um, lane for bikers or walkers to get across the, the car bridge and that people would use the car bridge if it was closer, unless there was an alternative, an inviting alternative to go down uh, Canal Street in the, other, in the direction facing traffic. So to keep bicyclists off of the car bridge, there needs to be a way for them to get down Canal Street. Well, I think that the idea of what a linear park of sorts along there is very appealing, especially if they can manage to play with the widths a little bit uh, to be able to have benches there. I mean, I think that if it gets down to the point where it's just a little section of sidewalk and there's not really any green there, it doesn't really make sense anymore. Mm -hmm. But if they think that there is enough room to have a strip where you can have trees and benches, that it's a, a 
extremely appealing feature because you're also keeping the view open as well instead of you know blocking it with cars parked there all the time. Right. But as they mentioned earlier, that you know, if, if you take away and narrow that down, when they plow snow in the winter, it, you can see it on the side of the street. You're adding about three more feet of, of they're going to take away because you're going to have a little plow snow sitting there until they take them away. So, yeah, and that's going to be right where those trees are going to be planted. And the bench is going to be, they're going to bury those basically. Yeah. When yeah. they plow. Yeah. So, I mean, as he said, you're going to kill the trees before they get a chance to get moving. One thing I was thinking is uh, we just have planters or something uh, along there just with nice flowers. And then if there was, we can't do benches along there, if we could at least have a bench or two on that viewing platform. Yeah. You know, then at least there's a place people can sit and look at. Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think the idea was to put benches here. You also currently have, oh, this doesn't go, but you have benches in this area too. And so again, we haven't talked about where it would go, but there is green space throughout this place to put benches back in if you so desire, because there are benches there today. Um, I think we would put in different benches, but there would be benches throughout. Um, right. And I think, you know, the idea is that this is, you know, this becomes your meandering river walk, walkway, right? Until down to here. Um, either way, I, I mean, we don't, I don't think we have, we, Bob Kleinfeld, Scott Burbank have a preference either way. Um, I do, I mean, the other thing is if you truly want to make this like a shared use path, you could eliminate the green strip and have a, you know, you can move this. So this is on the edge, put it in a seven inch curb here, have a five foot sidewalk or, or six or seven, right? And then have a very small green strip. I guess the question there is I'm not the one mowing a small green strip. And I know a lot of municipalities, what they're doing is they're going away from having, um, curb, green strip, sidewalk. And that's because what they're finding is when they're mowing that green strip, one, it's hard to do. And the other thing is if you do have, in this case, you don't have cars, but if you have cars parallel parked here, you know, they're kicking up stones and shooting them into people's cars. So the, the thought process years ago was curb, green strip, sidewalk. And now they've gone away to having curb, sidewalk, and then something else beyond the sidewalk, or you move the curb over and the, the bike path is within the, the, the you know, within the um, paved area, but you just, you're limited by width. That's all. So, yeah, I, mean, I think as Scott said, we're, you know, we're open to, if the town wants to make any changes here, eliminating these spots would result in, I believe it was a net loss of 11 spots within the project limits. So I know there's some other spots that over at the Waypoint Center, but eliminating these would yeah just be eleven with the diagonal be a net loss of what exists within our project area of disturbance. Um, and you know, if the town wants to do something different here, that's that's the town's decision. I will just say that this is something we would need an answer on sooner than later, since it does potentially have an impact on the right of way process. It sounds like I believe there are some rights. From yeah, the, the right of way. So where there. the fence is, that is actually the right of way line is right here. So I mean, we're going to need rights in this area, anyways. But yeah, we would need more rights down and here. It, it may just it may just change the type of right that we need. Yeah. Um, so we don't need an answer tonight. But I think you know if you could get back to us within the next month or two, if you want to do something different there, um, and, and also like I said, we're we're trying to get going on the landscape design. Um, and that sort of this this plays into that as well. Um, looks like there might be another opportunity for a little bench to to the the right of the transformer there, Scott, where the on the right side of the closer to the older bridge. There's sort oh, of right. some green space in there. I mean, you know, yep. there's there might be some other spots to squeeze in a little bit here or there. Um, so we'll we'll wait to hear from the town on any any guidance. Uh, for now, we're showing the parking sp spaces, but we can go a different route if the town would prefer. Yep, and I would sort of say maybe a month max would be even better. Just yep. really want to get moving on the, I want to finalize my roadway design sooner than later. But yeah, I think if you need to take time, discuss it over, but just understand that, I mean, you guys can do whatever you want. I will say that I tend to listen to the person who plows the road because they tend mm -hmm. to have the most experience and knowledge, but obviously, your road you guys can do whatever you would like to do 
if, if you're putting spaces there now, you're making the <clears throat> plowing more complicated because there are no parking spaces there at all. Now you're going to have someone plowing snow into the parking spaces, or if the cars aren't moved at night on top of the cars, you know, aren't, aren't moved from the snow emergency. So I don't think parking spaces are a maintenance free um, option either. No, but in theory, they could tow the car, right? I mean, I don't, I don't know how your policy works because I've never parked overnight in Bellas Falls, but I believe the parking ban, most parking bans are like, get off the street. And if you're there, you could be towed. So you're not wrong. The plow would have to come around here. And if there's a car parked, you know, it'd have to bump around and it wouldn't be easy. But I'm just saying the thought process is when they're plowing, there's a parking ban and the cars aren't on the road. Are they always not on the road? No. And it's not, you know, it's no different than further up towards the, the, the square, right? Where you have parallel parking and then you have a roadway. Although I think it's a little wider, but yeah, no, you're not wrong. Um, like I said, I don't, I don't know that me and Bob have a preference either way. We just want you to be aware of the constraints you have and just know that, you know, what you're showing here is not exactly what can be built. So in other words, benches and trees would not be here, but you absolutely can put in you know, we could widen the pavement and, and make it a paint it green and make it a bike lane. I mean, the, the traffic volume is such that I think in reality, the bicycles probably would just ride down the middle of the road and out and around. Yeah. 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 Especially um, I know Sharon's had her, Sharon, you had your hand yeah. up for a little bit. I just uh, got a little nervous when you were talking about taking out the bridge and undermine, you know, undermining the 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 under pot how would that affect my building in particular because that's what i care about if you yeah. shift the road the dirt underneath i mean what could possibly happen and how how will that be protected no i i think scott was talking about it was just the stability of the foundation of the existing bridge and and we're we're taking a look at that with our geotechnical engineers. So yeah, that the answer is I get fired, Bob gets fired. I'm not allowed to practice engineering in the state of Vermont anymore. So since neither of us want that to happen, the answer is nothing will happen to your building. And if it does, you don't have to worry about it. I'll be looking for a job. So I hope you're hiring because it won't end well. No, I think I think the, the I think your company will be looking for uh Yeah, that's right. Yes, you will yeah, sue. Right. Yeah, should. no, I think I would sue everybody. I think that so, that would cause me to yeah. to do something. Right. Yeah. So the answer is I was just explaining that that's the, how the physics work and that's why engineering wise we need to take a look at that and understand it better so we can prevent all that bad stuff from happening. So. Yes, please do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, agreed. Don't disagree with you. I don't want to change my ma name and have to move to Florida. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, I have a question about the old bridge. I mean, maybe this has been answered months ago, but why is it not? Is it really not strong enough for just people and bikes? Yes. Yeah, so we, right. We, we, we approached that with you. It's been a while. And the thought is it's absolutely safe enough for pedestrian bikes. But the problem is it's going to continue. Even if you repair it, it's going to continue to deteriorate, right? It's got that, that, you know, e-flow concrete is falling off of it. So the point is we could absolutely do that, but then you would be responsible for maintaining it for forever. Um, because the idea is the vehicular bridge is now the crossing, right? Which is your town bridge. So because of that, you would be responsible for maintaining it. And what happens as pieces fall into the canal and end up in the trash rack, you know, for Great River Hydro. Um, so the thought process is by removing it, we eliminate that risk that you're taking on by keeping it there and having to maintain it. So that was the decision by the select board is it's better to remove it and put in a pedestrian crossing, which now allows you to have that pedestrian connection, but eliminates the risk of that, the main, one, the cost of future maintenance costs, as well as the risk of having that bridge fail and go into the, canal, which then sends it to Great River Hydro's turbines. And, and further, the, the federal government is picking up the cost of removing the bridge now. If we don't do it now, uh, if don't we own it? Yes. And that's really been the entire complication <laughs> of this whole project is getting that bridge taken down. That's really the expensive part. That's right. the complicated part. Right. And it's like either you take it down now or you take it down later. It's just the take it down now. We don't have to pay for it. Right. Yeah, that's great. I can do that. 
I have one question uh, in terms of the constraints on our thinking about that stretch. Are those transformers movable or are those the only place they can be? So that's a good question. And the answer is there, we've worked with Green Mountain Power on reducing the thickness of this transformer. Um, because like I said, we had 11 feet because it was a bigger concrete vault. And so we've been meeting with them, coordinating with them, and it really isn't, I mean, at this point, this is where it's going to go. And that's because in order to build the bridge here, to demo the bridge, you know, down below and to build the other bridge, we can't have those overhead utilities up there. So we're undergrounding everything, um, which is nice. Um, but because of that, we need these transformers in order to transform the power as it goes to the individual homes on Phelps. So the answer is no, they're not really movable um, from a, like, you know, canal to Canal Street terminology. Um, could they move left to right? Yes, but the beauty of this is they've got them down to two transformers. So that really helps us, you know, minimize one. If you, if you know, we need at least two. And if we were to put another one in further down, then you're, there's less space you have for that future walkway or parallel parking. So the answer is no, they are pretty much where they, they need to be and what they're going to, to be. Um, and we've been, I mean, it's taken months to talk with GMP and understand their processes and what they can live with and then what we can live with. So um, we are very happy that they were able to reduce those vaults and allow us to get to the 14 feet that the town had asked for. So. And uh, essentially, Green Mountain Power will own those. Those would be property of Green Mountain Power. Yes, so they're in your right of way, so it'd be no different than any overhead utility within your right of way, right? They have a an easement, permanent easement, like to maintain them and access them, but they're in the town's property. So the town owns the property; they have the right to maintain and and do what they need to do. I guess is that Bob? That's correct, right? Yeah, I, I mean, my understanding is all of the electrical infrastructure, communications infrastructure that we're putting in becomes the property of the utility companies if that right. the town wouldn't be responsible for you know yeah. if for some reason uh, there's a problem with an underground line uh, or whatever that that's that's on green mountain power to to repair it does that answer the question yeah uh, yeah I, I was thinking in terms of um, painting, painting them if if the town wanted to paint them and they they're not big gray boxes they're not, and they're not going to be that big, right? Isn't it going to be two smaller vaults? Yeah. Now, Scott? So this, this is what we presented, but we have since discussed this with Green Mountain Power, and so we're going to be very large. And part of widening to get to the fourteen feet, we worked with them to get come up with two separate um, cabinets that are a little bit smaller. And, and I don't know what their what their policy is for painting them, but. Um, so they're going to look like, so that was the older version. So this is the newer version. So this is one vault. And then this is like a fiberglass. Um, so the idea is power comes in here and comes out of here. And this uh, this is a transformer for the two single phase. So the, the power that feeds your house. So I guess just to look at the fun. You guys are sure how many aerials we're actually taking out on that stretch? How many, how many uh, poles are coming out? Uh, I don't know other than to say everything from the vehicular bridge down to let's let's look. Um, I don't know the number of poles. Okay. Oh. So this is the drawing. So basically, you know, the pole that's here today, this pole that's here today, all get removed. Um, this pole is staying. They're adding a new pole because we can't have that many drops. So um, red is Green Mountain Power. I want to say orange is Comcast. Purple is, no, orange is Consolidated. Purple is Comcast. Green and blue, green is a spare telecom, and then blue is First Light and Lumen. And so they come from this pole, come across the road. They go back and feed this, this new pole here. The existing pole is here. Then go aerial like they did before to Rockingham. They come under here. This is the first um, vault we have with the, um, transformer um, and then so conduits come into here come out of here and they're all under the sidewalk and this house this house all get fed underground same thing here we have power coming to this new pole they're installing because the pole used to be over here so these poles are gone 
and they go back to the poles that feed Rockingham. Uh, and then we just turn sideways. So now Rockingham goes left to right um, and they continue underneath here, feeding power and telecom to these individual houses. This property gets an overhead. These are the two um, utility, the vaults we talked about before with the curb. Um, and then they go under here. Uh, these goes to Sharon's property under here. And then they continue across the road to here. And then they come back over here to the canal housing unit. And then they go over to here, which is your pump station right now on Canal Street is right here. And they pop up and some go across the canal, others come this way, and then everything goes aerial from this point back towards the square. So it's basically from the pump station, the pump station on Canal Street to the uh, utility pole across from the future Bellis Falls garage is all underground. With the exception of some back lots that feed Rockingham Street. And I mean, like, for instance, this is a telecom, right? That goes aerial to this property right here, which I believe, the, yeah, this is the office right now for do as part of their pro Bellas Falls property. So anyways, we um, obviously, I guess just so uh, Sharon knows and others know, we are going to schedule property owner meetings because we need to talk to all the properties on Canal Street. We've talked to Great River Hydro preliminarily. And so we have to conduct what our property owner meetings where we explain all the impacts to their property. And then that allows us to go into negotiations where we start to negotiate and acquire rights. So that all needs to happen. So that was a very quick explanation on utilities. So you want to move on to bridge rail? Sure. Let me pull this down. All right, bridge rail. Um, so what we're showing here is basically the common steel concrete combination rail that VTrans has. Um, this rail sh is showing galvanizing. So this is the back side of it, the outside fascia. And then obviously this is the inside. Um, you do not have a sidewalk on yours, so it'd be a shoulder similar to this, but it would all be smooth. And then this is galvanized and this is currently galvanized, which the nice part about that is we found that when the snow plow comes through, because the face of this rail is in line with the face of the concrete, if they scrape the concrete, they scrape, scrape the rail. So we used to basically galvanize these and powder coat them black, but a lot of communities are going against that because what happens is the snow plow scrapes the black off. So then you have black, same thing we we're talking about with the truss bridge. So generally they leave it galvanized. Um, so that is the proposed, and I don't know if Kyle is still with us or not, but the thought is that by having this be a smooth surface, it sort of represents the smooth lines of the arch. Yeah, Kyle had to jump off, um, and but I know he's done some coordination with the with the historic commission. I don't know if anybody's uh, here tonight with the with the town historic commission, and I believe the preference was to have a concrete steel combination rail. Um, we initially had looked at uh, just a steel rail with a concrete curb, um, but this this combination rail is what we use typically in in historic uh, historic settings where where that combination look is desired. I sent out a, a design concept for a similar railing with some modifications, um, just some different profiles on the concrete and um, I thought on the, the railing. I don't know if you have that. Yeah, yeah, we did see that. So, so this rail system is a crash tested rail system that um, they actually run a vehicle in and and do with all sorts of sensors in it. And and um, we're we're required to use crash tested rails wherever possible. So um, that is the reason we selected this rail and. Um, if if we make any modifications to it, um, it, it it would potentially violate the crash testing. There are some 
there are some inlays that can be done in the concrete. I think the preference was to not do that from um, Kyle's standpoint, just to sort of match the look of the arch that had had a had a smooth face to it. But that is something that could be done to give it a slightly different appearance if if desired. Can folks hear me? Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, I'm the uh, CLG coordinator, the Historic Preservation Commission coordinator. And um, this particular railing that we're seeing in the picture here is not what was uh, recommended by the commission. Uh, the, the railing that was recommended that we were offered an opportunity to uh, give feedback on several different options. And the option that we went with um, at the commission level was an option very similar to the, a railing that exists right now in, uh, on a bridge in Saxton's River. And um, I'm so, so I'm sort of curious and I'm a little taken aback by hearing that somehow this is now a vision of what the railing would look like. This is very radically different than what uh, the commission had uh, uh, had recommended to Kyle. I'm sorry that Kyle's not on yeah. board right now. But, uh, I do want. Oh well, yeah, Kyle had the job, and he, he did he did share that with us. And the issue is is that is not a crash tested rail system. So, like I said, from a safety standpoint, our preference is to go with a crash tested bridge rail. And I think you know here it is a low speed environment, but you do have a canal, which um, I don't think anybody wants to enter. So that sort of adds a a, a higher level of um, concern. Okay. At least. I, I understand where you're 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 going with this, but this this is um, something that uh, is there an opportunity for the uh, town to have a conversation about uh, this versus the 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 option that uh, the commission had recommended? There is, like I said, the issue is that rail that um, Kyle, I believe had discussed with the commission is not crash tested. So um, that's that's the issue. Uh, well, that's an my... issue from an engineering point of view, but from a, um, a town point of view as to, as, as to how the town might want to proceed. Is that is that an, an option that's open for discussion? It's open for discussion. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. yeah. There's a real. I, I I I certainly understand and I certainly appreciate uh, the need for uh, a, a very strong consideration of safety, um, and it but it is something that. Uh, 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 this is sort of a curveball from, from the standpoint of the commission, I think. And it's something that uh, we'll be discussing at our next meeting. Okay, yeah, my understanding was that, that Kyle had discussed this with you. So sorry if there was a Yeah, uh, no, he had, he had, he had offered us uh, uh, several different options to, if you will, vote for. And we voted for one, but we never heard back. Um, as to which one um, was going to be presented as uh, as the best option. Mm -hmm. so. so this this bridge rail, uh, slightly different since um, the the standard the the approach rail is slightly different. But this bridge rail was used in Saxon River on one twenty one on the bridge that we did there. Oh, was mm -hmm. it? seven six seven years ago maybe mm -hmm. um so there is a there is a version of this there i believe i think is the one you're referring to in saxon's river on the I'm not sure the road but it's 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 over it's uh, the road it's it's the road that that heads out towards uh westminster right so it's, yeah, it's right off of 121 yeah. over the yes yeah yeah so we can certainly talk about that i mean from from my perspective i'm you know, 
I'm hesitant to use a non-crash tested rail. And it's more than just the bridge rail. It's also the approach rail system that comes into it. That's, that's designed to reduce vehicles from snagging that concrete end block. Um, so it really is just a, a safety issue, but um, it's, it's something that's open for discussion. And, and I think probably the first step would be to, to discuss it with Kyle, unless the select board has any other thoughts um, from the, from that side of things. But I think Walter, if you probably be good for you and Kyle to touch base mm -hmm. and we can go from there. Yeah, we, we, we shall. What would be the speed limit on that bridge? 25, same speed limit at Canal Street is today. Okay. Are we set with this? Yep, yep. Move along. Absolutely. All right, so uh, travel and shoulder whips on, whips on the vehicular bridge. So, um, Basically, the bridge is 32 feet out to out, and the railing that we just displayed is one foot typical. And as I said, the fascia of the concrete lines up with the fascia of the hollow structural steel section. And so you still have 15 feet. It was just there was some question about whether we would go with 11 foot travel lane and a four foot shoulder or um, and that led to the question to the town, would you prefer a 10 foot travel aid with a five foot shoulder? And I guess just to be clear, what that means is there'd be a double yellow line, um, two inches from center line, you would have a four inch yellow line that go, you know, and another one over here. And then basically centered on this would be a four inch white line, which would be your fog line. Do you, you know, um, sort of, um, can't think of the right word I'm looking for, but basically, you know, starting your shoulder width. So, as far as we're concerned, 11-4, 10-5, I mean, I guess one thing to point out is that we would uh, we would probably line stripe, but I don't know that you guys have line striping on your roads today. So I do know in the past for local bridges, the thought was we will give you the double yellow, but if you're not going to maintain the white lines, then typically we wouldn't put those back on. I don't know, Bob, if you've heard that or not. I know that was something that I think Nancy Avery mentioned, but Ideally, we would paint two yellow, we would paint the double yellow, and then we would paint the um, white and white, and it would be up to you to maintain it. So um, I guess where we put the white line would be really up to you guys. Can I do something? Sure. <laughs> I, would, I would opt for the five foot shoulder over the four. <laughs> Because I mean, we, we we've talked about this, but even even though there's the penetration bridge, people are still gonna walk a bike probably. Across yeah, I think of, I think the bigger the shoulder, the better. Yeah. People are gonna use it that yeah. way. Yeah. They are gonna walk out there. Yep. Generally, narrower lanes are better for helping people slow down too. That's true. Even yeah. if it's only a paint line, it's still. You know, it just suggests that the road is right. narrower and they shouldn't be driving as fast as fast. Yeah, let's go with this. Yeah, let's go with time. All right, so 510. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and then the next one here would be um, oh, the island. All right, so this is uh, brought up was that we currently have a basically a painted truck apron. So the idea is that the truck pulls forward to the stop bar. And if it was to turn left or right, it would have to drive into that area that has stripes on it. And so um, this could be striped, but that means you have to maintain the striping or with the picture on the top, which is this is a Brown's Trace Road in Vermont Route 15. Um, they could do a truck apron. So a truck apron essentially is the granite curb is raised two inches and it has a 45 degree bevel on it, and then it goes straight. And then the rest of that is concrete. And basing the fact that, you know, you're looking at this and then the, the roundabout below, which is Vermont Route 15 and 108, I would say that you can, it looks like they stamp the concrete um, with something just so you have some texture. And the idea is the cars can make the corner, but when the tractor trailer comes along, it makes the corner, but the trailer, which is trailing behind it, rides over the truck apron. 
And so it just mounts it and off it goes. And that's why it's only two inches. Um, if you're a car, I just put this in here to show it to you, but I also like the fact that the Subaru took a more direct route. The Subaru should not be taking a more direct route and that's a bad Subaru, but you know, <laughs> I like to rally. So I just found that and, and took that picture legally, Bob, but I, I just think it's funny. Go straight, <laughs> go around. So anyways, it's just two examples of a truck apron. So the real concern here would be if you're the snowplow driver, this, you're just gonna go here and unfortunately scrape off the white paint. This, mm -hmm. I don't know, but there's a raise. So does the plow easily go over it? You would have to talk to the snowplow driver having no experience with that myself. Um, but I guess, does the town have a preference at this point? I mean, obviously the state of Vermont's maintaining this, the town of Jericho is maintaining this and the state of Vermont's maintaining this. So it's not like it can't be done, right? Um, and this just gives a more defined, as opposed to the line striping, this will last longer because um, this will be a granite curve. And like I said, it's basically a concrete slab. And then you have another granite curve on the outside out here. So just whichever you would prefer. Should we ask Andy Howard? If you want to raise yes. apron, you can plow that. It's not that big a deal. Do you want to raise apron? For the for the maintenance, because you'll end up painting that other thing constantly. Yeah. You'll never survive. You'd right. be lucky to get through two winters with that. Yeah. All right, let's go with that. So we're good too because it there again it, it was more suggestive that it is a place where you shouldn't just drive it, right. it narrows down the perceived area to help slow yes. cars. I think they're right great. Okay. Except when the car does that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the Subaru does not care. It's all-wheel drive, even in That's summer. It. That's it. He doesn't like know how to go around field. a rotary, obviously. <laughs> well, to be fair, that's a roundabout, and rotaries are different. But anyways, yes. Um, I mean, I can't say that I've never taken the direct route either in a truck, certainly not in a small car. But anyways, that's not the right way. So, okay, so we'll raise that. We'll put in a raised bed and a raised uh, truck apron, and we will move on. All right, the last one, stormwater treatment options. So we looked at these and basically the most economical one that, that will work for what we're trying to accomplish would be what's called a gravel wetland. And so I have a few examples of these to sort of show the varying degrees. So the one in the top right um, sort of shows those happen to not be Phragmites, but it's it's cattails, but most likely um, if you plant it and and put in, you know, something, the Phragmites will take over because I'm sure you have Phragmites. You know, you're on the Connecticut River. There's definitely Phragmites somewhere. Um, so you would have basically a grassed area with a depression, and then you would have this in it. Yours will be smaller because um, we only have to treat around 4,000 square feet because basically the difference between our net, um, our new impervious and our existing impervious is we're adding 4,000 square feet more of new impervious, so we require to treat that 4,000 square feet. And so we'll show a slide in a minute of where we're gonna do that. So the one on the left is more of a typical gravel wetland. Um, the one on the bottom, sorry, the one on the right top is your typical gravel wetland. The one on the bottom right, it, it has the same issues. It has, you know, Phragmites in it, but I just wanted to show that you can put in some woody shrubs and they have beautiful berries, so it doesn't have to be ugly. Nice red with the snow, so just something to note. And then the one on the left is actually in uh, Burlington at the city market. And this one, they planted a lot of plant material and they pay a contractor to come in and weed it in the spring and the fall. And that's why they have this wonderful um, veg that you're showing. So you certainly could plant nice flowers, but just know if you don't maintain it, um, because the way the gravel wetland works is that the water isn't at the surface, but it's just below the gravel. Um, it's wet and wet soil, making it a wetland, and though that attracts um, Phragmites, um, although we can plant grasses and hope they choke it out, but Phragmites is meant to win genetically, so that would be the option. But I, I still think you can make it look reasonable. So I guess any questions on that? Where, can you show on the map where these spots? Sorry, I didn't hear that. Next, go to the next slide, Scott, to show the oh, location. That's what I thought. Where are they going to go? Yeah. All right. That's what I thought I heard. So um, this is the island side. And so basically at 806 plus 00, the road goes downhill towards 808 plus 00. So the idea, and, and it also banks, or not banks, it also has a crown 
So from the, the center line that's along 806, 807, the road goes towards the New England Central Railroad tracks it, at 2%. And then it goes back towards the sidewalk on, you know, towards the bottom of the page at 2%. So the green areas that are outlined in red would be basically the two locations we would put it because essentially half of this area is 4,000 square feet. So we would treat this stormwater and then the other stormwater, as it does today, we would discharge into the canal. And this gets discharged into the canal too. It's just, it gets treated first before it's discharged into the canal. Um, so it's up to you where you want it. I mean, you can see in the middle that we have sidewalks on either side. So maybe not a preferred choice because you could definitely put flowers, trees, plants in there and have a nice garden or, or not garden, but you know, visual plant material and then sort of off by the railroad tracks maybe is a little less appealing in terms of plant material. So maybe we could hide it in, or put it in there. And then you would obviously have uh, trees between the chain link fence and your sidewalk with diagonal parking. So, but up to you, which side you would like to place it on. And Scott, the one at the upper part of the page, it doesn't necessarily need to go all the way out to the yeah, side. Yeah, sorry, I'm showing I mean, that very yeah. large, just to it show it very large, because we can put it wherever you want. It could hug the fence line a little bit more. It and, could hug the fence line more and, and be away from the, it will be away from the sidewalk because it's going to have to be slightly lower. So, so it's just one or the other one location. Those are the two. Right, yeah, because we don't need to treat as, we don't need both because we only have to treat like half, either the top portion of Depot Street in the parallel parking or the bottom portion of Depot Street, you know, gone towards the bottom of the page. And the parallel parking. So, who takes care of these? And, 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 um, in other towns, do volunteers take care of it? Does our highway department take care of these kinds of things? What, what do, they become a weed, sort of a weed patch, right? If you know, what they become. We have we have a garden committee, a club, or something. We used to have one person who passed away last year that used to take care of the, the stuff, like the fountain guardians. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, a, a friend of mine just just joined it. I don't know. I don't forget what it's called. Did, did you guys take care of the tubs and downstream? Yeah. So my group has been taking care of those uh, planters in the square and a lot of other miscellaneous little things, a uh, little garden by the hotel. Uh -huh. But yeah, it was Lee who took care of right. the, the ones the, around the you know the the water fountain down itself and right down the hill. And yeah. took care of it by the police station. She take care of the. Yeah. Um, very, very well, legion and so all that that, yeah. that shelf along the legion that was all very tough. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then yeah. there is there is a committee we're going to be working on that now, even though she's gone. But I haven't heard about it. I don't think there's a committee. I think it's just a who is uh, you like just volunteers and do this yeah. stuff around here. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, there's a garden club or something because a friend of mine is taking over the fountain. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not aware of that first one. Okay. But yeah, it, it, it's around here. Okay, so. Well, one question about, about this design. Uh, in that sort of wedge-shaped green area, uh, just at the, the end of the Welcome Center, yep. um, right in the middle of that area, the, the, we'll, um, there is currently a very nice oak tree. Is there any possibility that you can leave that tree standing since it falls within that green area in this design? There is always a possibility. Yes, so we do have tree protection and there are some trees where you're saving um, the nice oak tree. I mean, I, I believe the nice oak tree, sorry, I was sharing this, is this tree right here. And so it would appear that there is no reason we can't save it, although we will be digging, I mean, the concern, as you know, is the, the canopy of the tree essentially is the extents of its roots, right? So if the tree leaves go out 10 feet in diameter, that's the drip line where the water takes the leaves and drops into the ground, and that's essentially the sense of the roots. So the concern would be to remove the existing curbing that's there today. Um, we might get a little close to the drip line, but that doesn't mean we can't try to save it if that's something the town would be in favor of. And then... Obviously, if it doesn't make it, then we would have to remove it. But I don't. I don't Bob, think you those, have a preference I, on that. Well, I don't. I don't think it could be saved with in the gravel wetland. If that's no, no, no. Yeah, if the gravel asking. wetland's there, it'll die because there'll be salt. Yeah. But so. if but if you put if you put the gravel wetland up top and 
you know, that's something we can talk with uh, Bonnie, our landscape architect, just to see if I, I know. I know she's she's really excited to get going on the landscaping design here, and and she would know if it's possible to take that curbing out and save that tree. And right. Uh, but if your question was if it could remain there with the gravel wetland, I, I think that's that's well, probably not. That possible. is a no. But without it, yes, it can be the centerpiece of whatever you want to plant. Well, whatever she puts in for planting that you would then review and approve. Yeah, I would. I think I would prefer to have the gravel wetland closer to the railroad tracks because that already you're already getting into an industrial look there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah um, I agree. And having the green space um, with the oak tree in that where it currently is, I think, yeah, is keep better. One, yeah, keep the oak tree that way. Yeah. Whether it's that oak yeah. tree or if we have to plant a new one, you know, we can have a tree there. Yeah. 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 And it keeps a low profile in front of the train station. People like to sit there and watch the train come in. So. Yeah. I guess we want to go sure. to the take photos of the train. Yeah, the top one. Top one. Yeah. Yep. That would be our preference for your landscape. All right. Garden. So we will put it in the top one. Excellent. Thank you very much. And uh, with that, I believe we're done. Um, so um, Ms. Barry has been taking notes. So I guess, Scott, would you like us just to send you the action items for the select board? To I mean, I know you're recording the meeting and you will type up the notes, but if you want us to send those to you tomorrow, just so you have a sense and we can compare and then. Um, we can provide any information and we have our own action items to look at. So we will take care of that. Um, that sounds great. I think we're, we're good. So we'll let you get back on to the rest of your meeting. Okay. I think you have to give thank me the, much. thank you very much. You get to transfer the permission back to me. Yes. And this scares me because I always worry I'm going to just cancel the meeting for everyone, but I will uh, do my best here. That's right. I have to stop sharing. You won't make us sad if you do that. <laughs> I just fear like one of these days I'm going to hang up. Oh, I know what happens. If I hit end, it says, do I want to transit back? And it does. So I will hang up. And if the whole thing disappears, that's Scott's fault. And I apologize. <laughs> okay. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. Wouldn't that organization see? RG, C, 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 yeah. Historic preservation. Yes. Uh, it go CLG okay. stands for certified local government. Oh, okay. <laughs> it doesn't write. It doesn't make sense for the back of the All right. Are we ready to continue with our regular meeting? Oh, yes. 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 Let's get on to uh, the appointment. This is a ratification of Kathleen um, yes, Martin. Kathleen yes. Martin. We did that uh, two weeks ago at that meeting since uh, she needed to get her renewal uh, done. So I would like a motion to ratify the appointment of Kathleen Martin to the DRB. I move that we ratify the appointment of Kathleen Martin to the uh, DRB. Second. Second. Motion made second to ratify the appointment to the DRB of Kathleen Martin. All those in favor would say aye. Aye. Uh, all those opposed, nay. Motion carried. Hey, uh, Scott, I'm going to turn that next one over to you. The red agreement renewal. There's a information in your packet. This is to do with the theater. Right. So had a little discussion there just for the board's uh, edification about Spectrix. And I know there's been commentary about is there other you know, options and opportunities. And at this point, I've had you know, conversations with Charlie and, and Alyssa's had conversations with Charlie and for the the direction that we're moving in terms of supporting more live theater, you'll see the Spectrix costs uh, go down as we do more events. So I think our recommendation is we continue with at least for another year and then see where we are. If we're at our 24 uh, events per year goal that, that Charlie and I have been working towards, then I think you'll see that, that become less of a uh, fixed cost and there are other features in Spectrix that, that Charlie is looking to try and enhance the opportunities for Red to do some other, you know, using the data from Spectrix and using some other tools that are available to help market and grow some of the, the support for the, for the uh, Opera House. Um, so with that being said, um, just from my standpoint, the at least the partnership with Red has been very helpful to us in terms of 
providing you know professional oversight and assistance and maintaining <laughs> programming and upgrading things like the marketing and and being more available to do uh, productions on a more professional basis so i think the relationship has been very beneficial from a staff standpoint um i think we're all a little disappointed in the theater uh, rebound from just the uh, movie going public and, and i'm not sure where we're going to be another year from now because as you look at the national numbers they're down 45 to 55 percent and we're trending in the same basic area so that's a discussion the board might have to have as we go forward in terms of the number of nights we show movies or how we want to exhibit movies and how that impacts the operation of the theater going forward um, i don't think we have to do that right away um, but that is something I think we have to at least put on the board's radar and have a conversation, you know, budget time next year when we have two solid post-COVID years and be able to say, where are we realistically, what are the trends, and how do we then try to make sure that we can at least get this operation as close to break even or potentially money making as possible. Um, the last thing I'll do, and then I know Charlie's on if he wants to jump in. We have been working on a theatrical lighting project. Uh, Gary has been very, very helpful in getting contractors and coordinating, and I'm sure you've seen all the, the activity up in the attic. So they're working on the, the welding, and we were pushing to get this project completed to support the March production. And on a telephone call on Friday, we were told that supply chain issues now have basically stopped the last piece that we need, which are the electronic lift devices, which lift the lights back up into the ceiling. And so now they have postponed our, our dates originally. They told us it would be available to us sometime in February. Now we're being told May. So we're gonna miss the March event. We've let the folks know that are doing the production. Um, they're as disappointed as we are. Um, and now we hopefully will get these installed later in the spring so that we'll have an opportunity to uh, to really showcase these these new lights and all the options and, and things they can do because it has tremendous capability but unfortunately it's not going to make this this uh, March event so okay anybody have any questions I think we got Charlie I don't know I've, I've got a couple of questions just sure show. if Charlie wants to jump in and embellish anything I've already said Charlie you have anything you're muted. You got to take your mute off, Charlie. What do you want me to say? <laughs> <laughs> it's rosy and it's great, Charlie. That's what we want you to say. We're making money. <laughs> and great. No, it, it hasn't made money in years. We're we're doing not. We're really not doing badly at all. Um, the the movies have a dedicated uh, audience. Uh, recently. You know, it's trending well. Uh, I think we're keeping expenses down very well. The live stuff is, you know, we had 440 paid for Dar Williams, uh, the first Ray Masuko concert series on Saturday. Uh, we're looking good for the one in April. Uh, basically, you know, the, the on-screen advertising is doing very, very well. The Wednesday night classics are we have great support from community businesses. Um, I think I just feel very encouraged about our general trend. I think the team is working well. Uh, I think we're in the best place we've been in years. So, do you have any questions? I've got a quick one. Uh, first of all, Charlie, thanks for what you and Red are doing. You guys are doing a fantastic job. Um, I've got a question. I'm a Spectrix skeptic. And okay. I wanted to tell you the the Spectrix fee annual fee is twenty five thousand dollars, right? No, no, it's fifteen thousand dollars. You're muted. I can't hear you. You pay two dollars a ticket. I can't. I can't hear you. Can you hear anyone else? Can you hear me, Charlie? I can hear you, Peter. Hey, he's asking. He says it's fifteen thousand for the year. You pay seven thousand dollars, and then something about two dollars a ticket oh. to come. 
No, no, it's $15,000 a year is what you pay for the Spectric system. The Spectric system is entirely integrated into our website. So what you see on the website is the public facing side of Spectrix. So the movies are available to be purchased online. That is populated through Spectrix. The concessions that you can buy online is through Spectrix. The development that we're working on of memberships and uh, uh, annual support is through Spectrix. So Spectrix is much more than just a ticketing system. Now you're mentioning the $2 a ticket charge. That is $2 a ticket revenue coming to the town whenever we do a live event. That is what we charge the public for, or we charge the promoter and the promoter can choose to either absorb that call, that cost or charge the public that. Um, it is, and any ticketing system is gonna charge at least that. Um, so the $2 is actually revenue toward the town as opposed to an expense to the town. Spectrix is $15,000 a year for up to $250,000 a year in ticketing revenue. And we're nowhere near hitting that right now. Yeah, thank you, that, I didn't understand the $2 um, charge. So that, that it's revenue, not a cost really. Exactly. Okay, thank and you. I'm happy, I am happy to sit down and go into detail about what Spectrix does. I am not crazy about Spectrix. I find them opaque. Uh, it's like trying to negotiate with a house cat to try to get what you want, but it is very powerful. Uh, and I just, I feel undecided about it, but I, I'm not like, oh my God, Spectrix is the be all and end all, but Spectrix is certainly a respectable and viable choice that we have made. Long-term, whether that's what we stay with, I think Scott and I are in agreement that we look at it after one more year and see, yeah, is this right for us or not? Thank you. Anyone else? So you're hearing now that I will take a motion to uh, renew the agreement with Red for another year and authorize our manager to sign the document. I move that we authorize the uh, renew the red contract and authorize uh, the manager to uh, make that happen. Second. I'll second. Motion made and seconded to renew the contract with red for another year uh, and authorize the manager to sign the document. Is there any further discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor would say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Motion carries. It's unanimous. Thank you, oh, I, I, just a second. I, I'd like to talk about bridge railings for a while. <laughs> Wait a minute. You had your chance, Charlie. You missed it. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Thank you. See you later, Charlie. That was a great show. Plenty. Oh, God. Okay. Uh, hazard mitigation grant uh, for a uh, user's application for the culverts on Leak Road. Correct. So, from previous storms, we have replaced and upsized one of the culverts, and that one culvert actually functioned during the July storm. And the other three, which have not been replaced and upsized, all failed, which led to a $419,000 repair of Leach Road. So working with uh, the state hazardous mitigation folks and a lot of assistance with the engineers, they actually brought on uh, independent engineers to help us with the benefit cost analysis because all of this with FEMA money has to go through an, a ridiculous PCA. So it was a lot of work through the summer working with these engineers, working with Betsy and working with Gary to try to get all the numbers and, and with, uh, with Andy. So we finally got everything in and we were able to get the project costs down to, uh, it has to be at least a one-to-one -one BCA. So we got the numbers now to work it's a 90-10 program, so you'll see that if we're successful and we're funded and we are now fully submitted, we will receive roughly $810,000 and we'll be roughly on the hook for a $90,000 local share. But given how the other culverts have performed, 
I can guarantee you that you will never replace that road again one if this this project is accepted so we're hopeful that this will push that project, you know that down the road and if we're successful and get this money we'll, we'll come back to you with the grant agreement obviously and go forward with it but at this point we just wanted it for your information and that has been on our to-do list for decades yeah <laughs> yes Thanks, a lot so. of work a lot of effort, a lot of help. And so in this need, case, the states have actually been helpful. We need any action on this or just this? Not until we get okay. the authorization from the folks at the Vermont Emergency Management okay. that we were funded. And then I'll come back to you. Again. And we would hopefully have that money for the match in our, yes. our reserve funds once we get into the next fiscal year. Yep. Okay. Yeah, this will not happen quickly. And in fact, they couldn't even tell me when it might happen. So. It'll be as big a surprise to me as it is to you. So the, the ten percent match is going to come on. It's, it's, uh, I assume it's fund balance. You got on on page five. I five just of, I just sent them our existing highway fund fund balance. Oh, so they okay. Can see I, that we I, had I, cash I didn't know here. if you were referring to that's where we're trying to take the money out. I know we're no. not but taking money out of. Well, it yeah. would be. It, would it be, wouldn't be the twenty percent. So. I'm, but it would be the fund balance from the year we're currently in because this isn't going to happen this fiscal year. Right. I would be shocked. And the money we were talking about taking yeah. out for taxes is last year's fund right. balance. Yeah. So we're okay. We're yeah. okay. Yeah. But it's just I want to bring it to the board's attention because I know it's been a long-standing issue and we're at least in the game. We'll see how it goes. Okay, let's get to the uh, the resolution that the uh, development needs for their. Uh, Better connection grant, sixty-seven thousand five hundred. Gary, you taking that, or you want to stop run with that, or? Oh, what did Betsy use uh, as that? Uh, oh, Betsy comes this one. Yeah, she sings and dances too. Hi. So yes, I'm with the development office as well as the Bellas Falls downtown. Um, kind of started with a wayfinding project. We just spoke to Richard Amore and Matthew Aramcino from VTrans and um, ACCD. So what they would like to see is, is more than just a wayfinding project. So this is going to address a lot of the things that Walk Bike Committee, um, Saxon River Trail Initiative, um, all the way up to Herx Cove. We're gonna connect Herx Cove to Westminster, west to Saxon's River, east across the river. Um, yeah, what else did I write in there? Um, so wayfinding, uh, streetscapes, there are certain intersections that either need help, need crosswalks, um, bike and pedestrian walks. We'd like to kind of reconfigure the sidewalk going north from Rockingham um, Street. So the past lease size, how the sidewalk gets really narrow and it's all wiggle waggly right on the edge of, and you're looking down at the railroad, but you're also looking at the river. So what a concept to actually address that, maybe extend the sidewalk up and um, fix the crosswalk. So you're not crossing just north, just south of uh, Pond Road where people are still flying, coming by Hetty Green and coming down the hill into um, downtown. So there's that section, there's Dairy Joy, there's an intersection um, that needs to be addressed. We'll have points of interest, we'll have kiosks. Um, so this very large scale project needs planning and design. And that's pretty much what this grant is for. Um, so we're gonna get everything that we wanted to have in, in the last two years, kind of assess, um, identify the gaps, take all of our assets and resources and uh, for residents and visitors, so they'll know where to go um, from each checkpoint. So the train, they get off the train and they know um, trails, they know where they can get coffee, where, oh wow, we're gonna ride our bikes up to, um, you know, the Wakota Trail and watch the, or maybe not get the sunset before then they get back on the train. So. Um, and and so the money pays landscape architects and, <laughs> Uh, the connectivity with the other uh, pay, pays for the um, landscape architects for the master plan um, and the connectivity pieces. So this is this the plan, right? Yeah. Like, like in other words, will it work? 
And you asked me to put the side yeah. Tra transportation and landscape architects. That's what we're talking about. So will they give us like action steps? And we can identify which pieces are we going to do first. And then um, because VTrans is involved, it'll be like, okay, well, now another grant is coming down the pipeline and this project would be perfect for this. And that's where we just take funding stacks. Um, so for example, Springfield won a Better Connections grant and they did their come to Cascade uh, Park. So now there's a park right along the river, they added lights. Um, I think eventually it's going to, you can actually be on the river through to the um, Park Street or whatever that uh, red light is. And then they're working on past that um, because they have five, five different waterfalls that were just Springfield had their back to. And now that's going forward. Um, and yeah, look at all the river access that we have that really we don't utilize. So this will formalize the money that you'll need and give you a scope of what you'll want. And then you go after like the downtown transportation fund applications and you go and you fill those gaps with transportation alternative grants and places that, that will fund that because you've got all of the nomenclature that you need to, to meet all the grant requirements. And then they'll just you'll just start plugging those those gaps, as, as Betsy said, depending upon the phases. So it'll give you a roadmap to get all the improvements that you want to get to. That's great. Do you need a letter from us, the select board, or how, what, what, what's the next step? We just need that signed. Um, the grant application is due February 17th. So, so, so we need a resolution of support. $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, right. When we get the grant, yeah, then right. we'll have to come back for authorization. Okay. So, but. All right, take a motion to approve the uh, resolution for the better connection plan. Um, I, move, I move that <laughs> approve resolution for the better connections grant. We are second. Second. Motion made and seconded to approve the resolution for the better connection grant in the amount of 67500 if we get it. And requires a $7,500 match from the town of Rockingham. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor would say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Motion carries unanimous. Thank you. Finally, we get to Alyssa. Are you still with us? Finances. Wake up, Alyssa. <laughs> I am barely <laughs> with you. She said she's barely with us. I know. This is way <laughs> past where she's been. <laughs> You're losing me. I, no, you've lost us too. Trust me. <laughs> We're frozen to death. Yeah, it's really cold down here tonight. <laughs> okay. Um, questions. Uh, page one of 13. And this is under revenue, I guess, and expenses. Oh, um, if you look at uh, CLG grants, it shows that we've actually spent or actually received 5785. Then you get down to the bottom of the page and it says, CLG grants again to seventeen thousand thirty-seven dollars. So, what what went on there? Does anybody know? Yeah. So that I I was moving that state grant one. I was moving it up to grants. Oh, okay. Well, um, yeah. So I need to move that budget line. I just need to do an entry to move that seventeen thousand budget line. Up to there. Okay. So the grant has been received, though, correct? This, this that por that portion of it. I think there's more to come. There is more to come. I think right. They do it in. Yeah. Page yeah. two. Uh, fire department charges. I I, I think that's twenty seven thousand is for the illegal burns that we're waiting on. Or it was billed. It has not been received, and the, and the question is going to be if we're going to get paid. And that's the, we're working with the lawyer on that at the moment. That's potential revenue. That's, all. that's potential revenue. Yeah. Actually, okay. Okay. Just well, a matter of point of information that the uh, under on page three to fifteen, the cinema, as Charlie mentioned, this and Scott mentioned also, is doing poorly in the movies. It's fifty percent of what we budgeted. So revenue actually and uh concessions so they're a little bit behind 
Yeah, but they are, if you actually, I actually added cinema and the theater. Yeah, the theater and makes, then, up, it makes them up some of it. And then right. even if when you take away the state grant, where they're still, they're, they're keeping their expenses down. Yeah, I know. It's I'm, equal. I'm just going close. Yeah, no, I know that, yeah, but I mean, the, the listening yes. public who doesn't have this in front of them. Um, yeah, the challenge is the theater, the movie revenues. Yeah, yeah. Revenue yeah. Revenue yeah. Town, yeah. No, it's not the only place. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's yeah, it's not. And we, we do see it as a way for the show community to have something. Show yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's, it's yeah. kind of like the rec department. Yeah, that we'll move next year. Um, page four or 15, very bottom of the page, opioids, opioid settlement expenses. Uh, revenue. Um, I think it was ninety nine fifty, and they spent. We gave that to the uh, that group that was doing that, the four thousand, right? Right. Yes. right. But we did okay. get more revenue right. for that. Uh, okay. There is a revenue somewhere that offsets. It's like nine thousand. Yeah. yeah. And we're apparently not getting more money from distributors, so there's these little dribs and yeah. grabs. Right. You know, four thousand here, three thousand there, but. Hmm. Oh, let's see. Under page six of 15, just a question I'm kind of confusing here. Under zoning recording fees, we're showing $1,740, but yet if you look at the permits, the permits are only issued, you only got $605. Are we behind in collecting money for permits that have been issued? If we had to pay out $1,700 worth of recording, there should be some matching funds there somewhere, I would think. When Chuck left, we got a whole pile of zoning recording that had to be done. So that was where that 17 came from. Okay, but do we, do we have any, did we collect the, the uh, zoning uh, fees for the, the offset that? Yeah, might not all have even been this year. There was multiple. That I don't know. I think some were even prior years. Uh, okay. And then what are we percentage wise for? He he didn't. I mean, when he left, he he left, right? Because a while he talked about maybe helping us out, but we're not paying him to do no, that. No, we're not. I okay. I think it's on a consulting basis. One of the staff here just. Uh, well, it's certainly available if I need him by phone or email, but we're not. Yeah, he's not on the not, payroll. Of this yeah. Side. Right. No, I mean, not that he had offered that. I just right. didn't know what happened with that. Okay. Yep. <laughs> uh, page fifteen. Uh, 13 of 13, excuse me. Cinema material and supplies, uh, almost 100% of what we budgeted. What was that? Do we do the lighting stuff or something? Or? 13, 13, what? Page 13 of 13. We have 2225 budget and we spent 2208, 89, almost 100% of what we budgeted. I don't know what that was for. Just curious. It, it doesn't have anything to do with the lights, no. Okay. Hey. Okay. Peter, um, I've got one. Something. Oh, Pete, are you still going? Oh, yeah, I'm going. I've only got a couple more questions. Right, go ahead. Uh, page uh, one of five is under the highway fund. Uh, the FEMA revenue, we still, there's no none posted yet. We know we received some, but we're still waiting for it to balance. We have not received everything. We have not received all of it. We still are waiting on a couple of our project okay. motions. <sighs> Three or five highway department. On the 2022 one-time Chevy pickup, that's $5,200, $5,201 on that. Everything's think it's only one year old. Is that for the plowing equipment and stuff, do you think? That was the additional, right, to add a plow frame. And the $600 cup. Right now, that was just equipment, right? Yeah, in the, in the truck. For, I think there was also the framing of the yeah, yeah there was some. I, I, I remember there was some right. stuff with that. Okay, right. I'm just curious, Peter. And, uh, yeah, on that FEMA, going back to that, all of yeah. that money that we're supposed to get from that grant from the FEMA grant was recognized mm -hmm. last fiscal year. Oh, okay, so there won't this. Yeah, this line item will not will not have anything in it. 
because we already recognized well, it. I, well, just, yeah, I thought that was related to what we were waiting on, that's all. Nope, there's a receivable out um, on the books. So. Right. And there's a couple other trucks in there that are kind of uh, <laughs> kind of the two trackless snow sidewalk plows. It's interesting, the newer, newer one almost double the cost of the repairs on this older one. <laughs> yeah, uh, he had he had something pretty major break on that one. Yeah. Um, question: the, the if you get on the, the same page of uh, eight of uh, four or five equipment purchase and small tools repaired. Seems like we spend a lot of money on those. I don't know. Maybe I. Maybe they're wearing things out fast than I think they are, but it's a lot of money to be spending, I think. Small tools and apply and, and uh, repairs, 5,000 out of eight. The other one was 9,000, we put eight in there. So, a new Miss Lane Sprungford. Yeah, that's I don't know what's all in there. And those, we'd have to take a look at it. We'll get back to on those, Peter. Those, <coughs> Okay, I'm done. Anybody else can have at it? Okay, one, um, page one of 13. Uh, Alyssa, you've been working so hard on the uh, tax, the revenue, and the tax sales. Could you walk me through where we are? I, I see an adjusted budget of 105. I see actual 73,479. The percentage is at 69%. Can you explain to me what that means? Um, where, where are you looking? What what line are you looking at? One of 13 under penalties and interest. Okay. And, and so so we, we the adjusted budget is what we explain. I, I don't know what that means. So the budget, that's what was voted on. Okay. So, that, so these are our, our budget numbers for revenue for, for everything there. And then... Mm -hmm. And then the actual is what we've actually collected in interest and penalties. All right. And so the remain the amount that's not collected. But these are not from prior. Uh, these are not reflecting prior years, so Alyssa. I think that's it's what both. It, it's both. There's there's interest for current taxes and interest for delinquent taxes, which we've right. exceeded the interest for delinquent taxes. And the penalty you won't get until after the last payment. So that's okay. why there's nothing shown there. Right. All right. And we and we actually um, have collected quite a bit of money from the original tax sale list. I think that's a tribute to you. Yeah. Well really. it's, it's amazing when they get the final I, notice. For, I think yeah. a lot of it is VHFA. <laughs> Changes motivation. It's, 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 it's just a different. It, it hits seeing, differently. Seeing your property in the local paper. Makes yeah, that, that does. Yeah, yeah that and also hits differently too. That kind of. Yeah. Yes, it does. Takes the bell off. On on right. Friday, VHFA paid two properties off, twenty eight thousand dollars. Wow, amazing. That's right. They were and they were on the tax list, but because they applied to the VHFA, we had to take them off. And so they've just kind of been sitting in limbo. And last week we got twenty-eight thousand dollars. Amazing! I understand you're working with uh, with Paul Noble's office to uh, advise people about the, those uh, funds that are available from the state. Uh, yeah, Pam's doing all that. Yep. Okay. Sufka's helping too with things like the uh, people that are not filing their homesteads properly or not taking their uh, veterans exemption. So they've really been trying to help people. As well as Pam is also pointing a lot of people to the rehab programs and other programs. So it's great. It, you know, the challenge is those things are one time funded, and I don't think they're going to continue to be yeah, So, But do we know how much is left? I mean, there's still money available. They don't tell us anything. Okay. So, plus, they will only tell you that the, yeah, it was over. Yeah. They, 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 they were over, but then they just extended it. I'm still trying to talk. Yeah, I was just saying to Susan that I just don't know how much is available statewide. They never made any of that clear, you know, what the pool is of total funds available. Okay, let's go ahead. 
Yeah, they they had they had shut it off. They said that you have to do it by this date, and then they must have had more money left because they opened it back up. Okay, anyone else? Okay, what's the date of the tax sale again? I forget. The twenty third, I believe, of February. Yep. Yes. And let them be conducted by Ankuda's office. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay anybody else have anything on financial? Betsy? Can you just say where it's going to be? I've had people ask. Might it be down here? Usually oh, it's here. Usually it's, they, we do it down, down here. here. Okay. Usually, like we do it often. But when is it? It's not about a decade ago. It was here. <laughs> We're going to keep it. Once you put it down, I'm going to keep that. <laughs> Okay, uh, well, um, town hall phone. We, sp we spend quite a lot of money on phone. Is there any better deal we can get? We are testing right now a product from T Mobile that might reduce our current cell phone and possibly our. Um, we're not sure if it'll handle some of the data needs in the police cruisers, but we're looking at it and. Um, we're, we're testing them now just to see coverages and to see if they work. And they're under a nationwide plan that is cheaper. So we'll let you know. So we literally have phones now in our possession that we're going to test out. Okay, very good. Okay, anything else? Yeah. Nope. Hey, right. we're going to go approve orders for the ones. I'll take a motion and we'll pass one around. I'll second that. Okay, motion made and seconded to review and approve orders for the ones. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed nay. Motion carries. Coming around. Agenda items for January 17th. Uh, so I got the wrong date. It's February. I was going to say January is already coming and gone. How about February? <laughs> February. No. It's the 23rd, uh, whatever, 21st, 21st, yeah. 21st, yeah. Okay, okay we will need to ratify that uh, resolution that yep. we just did. Yep. I'm going to go out of the habit of doing those ratifications. Uh, you might want to re readdress uh, some of the bridge questions. We'll just get that done. And yeah, we have to decide how to make those decisions. The yeah, I think they really want to know something before. Yeah. Another thirty days go by. So I, I had a bunch of questions in, in regard to the right of way, but I didn't think that tonight was night to bring it up. Does anybody have a problem? I'm going to send this to the cling filter. It's all about the right of way, and uh, basically the state owns a property down there in Eglinton Railroad, where our road will come out into the parking lot. In case of new bridges, they they give you a right of way. And it's not uh, lease land. They, they lease it to radio railroad until 2051. So if we put the road over there, can the railroad take it back? We don't know that. That's the question's never been answered. The legal answer to that is yes, because they won't, you won't be able to take title. The railroad property will always be railroad. You'll be you'll be approved for a long-term improvement. And I don't know of any situations where they have come back and taken a structure like a bridge or a, or a road or a, you know uh, any any significant public improvement. I'm not aware of that, but there is always that risk. But that's that's the way the railroads have been. Well, it was interesting yeah. because of some uh, sometime in the past they sold the state sold the railroad uh, part from the railroad Brooklyn Railroad Yard to the power company with the old brown buggies. If they can do that, they should be able to look at the town permanent right away instead of on the loose property that can be taken back by the railroad. Not that they would, but I mean, right. there's always that open question that you know, if you spent $9 million to build a bridge, and 10 years later, somebody comes back and says, oh, guess what? We want that land back. And now right. you have no way to go out the bridge. Right. Who's negotiating that for us? You've got that's all tied up in the whole right away right. stuff. Okay, you you'd be the lead negotiator on that. Well, they'll bring the right away back to the board because we have to approve and accept yeah. whatever easements we're going to ultimately be responsible for. Right. So that whole right of way thing is probably going to be a pretty lengthy. Oh yeah, discussion. Why well, it's like well, you've you know, got hydro, like you've got phase, state, like yeah. a big yeah. phase. Of the yeah, project. there's a lot of right away yeah. on this project. You got the power company, and you know. 
everything else involved right it's just illegal and and how much of these right away questions are also tied into the train station i mean can we be doing both of these at the same time because you know, well, we're hoping that one of the things we're trying to get established is with this amtrak uh platform project is to really establish where the right of way actually is so they're actually doing survey now so we'll be able to delineate as part of our purchase what we would potentially own right what the railroad would own and then what the other right of way would be for like roads and you know i think there's also again i think there's some i don't know if there's other interest through there i can't recall if the hydro has some interest there as well well, I mean, I'm thinking of that area next to the train station where a lot of people park to drop people off. Mm -hmm. And if there's a business in there, I mean, and are we going to have to have handicapped parking close to the train station, not the ones that we just spoke about? So all of those questions about where that would happen. Well, we want to continue a conversation we started with the railroad about the gravel lot where they used to park for the old Christmas trains. Yeah. About doing some work in there. So that we could use that as a gravel parking lot as we go through construction. We're gonna have a massive amount of displacement while we're going through this, this construction process. Yeah. So, right. so we'll, we'll be to be yeah, all in the works. So yeah. Okay. Um we're kind of going off the subject of uh, annual media, the meeting on the 17th. Um any other anybody have any idea what they want on the agenda for the joint board on May 30th? That's a ways away. <laughs> Uh, this is the after memorial day too. I think so. we get your town meeting. <laughs> you have a little bit of time to, to worry about that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That seems like a lifetime from that. Another business, Bonnie. No. Rick. Nothing. Uh, just a reminder: taxes are due the twenty uh, on the thirteenth. It's next week, folks. Wonderful news. I think Scott got some updates on uh, another issue on the Cooperman's Bridge. I'll let him give you the good news on that one. So I'm all set. The engineer for the, the bridge on 121 sent us a letter that you got that? they are now having to do additional design work. So they're going to be putting in more piers. And, and so they pushed the <coughs> construction date for that bridge out till 2025. Oh my God. But I had sent them an email saying, well, because of that now, is there a possibility of widening the bridge so that we could put a bike lane? And I got an email back from them, of course, saying no. <laughs> so, <laughs> more to say that. so here we are. Even, that's a whole bridge. Even though there's, and they swear that it's not going to require, I don't, I don't know. So I, I just am telling you that because we might have to continue harassment the point being they are such a, in such a redesign i can't imagine how you can't add a four foot I, at grade yeah. paved surface to that bridge i, I just don't fathom it. thank was, you for pursuing it somebody could explain yeah. it to me. Yeah. yeah so there we are and they have moved the date now so you've lost another 18 months off of that project do you have any other business so no well, I do. Yeah. um just so we know, uh, you see you have your town report in front of you, and Sue and I made a successful delivery to the persons that we dedicated it to this afternoon. So we're home pretty for our duty on that one. So we can talk about it now. It's yeah. kind of surprised of a reception. They're very appreciative. Yeah. That's great. great. So that being said, no need for an executive discussion today, so I'll take a motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Second. <laughs> Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye.